July 14th, 2020 meeting of the Planning Commission. I call this regular meeting to order. I would like to ask Madam Clerk to call the roll. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, Vice Chair Wang. Present. Commissioner Takahashi. Here. Commissioner Fung. Here. Commissioner Saxena. Here. And Chair Moore. Aye. Present. And we will begin with approval of the minutes. Item one, subject to draft minutes of the June 23rd, 2020 meeting, recommended action approve or modify the draft minutes of June 23rd, 2020. And please take a moment to review them if you haven't had time. I'll make a motion to approve. I second that. Madam Clerk, will you call the vote? Yes, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fung? Uh, I vote yes. Commissioner Takahashi? Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Saxena? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Wang? Aye. And Chair Moore. Aye. Thank you, motion carries. 3-2 with Takahashi and Saxena abstaining. Right. Thank you. Um, as a reminder, this meeting is being conducted pursuant to the provisions of the Brown Act and a recent executive order issued by the governor to facilitate teleconferencing to reduce, reduce the risk of COVID-19 transmission at public meetings. Ordinarily, the Brown Act sets strict rules for teleconferencing. The governor's executive order has suspended those rules. The executive order does require that we continue to notice meetings in advance. The city has met all the applicable notice requirements. Members of the public may offer public comment by email to planning at cupertino.org prior to the close of the public comment period for each agenda item. Staff will share all such comments with the commission and make them part of the record. If you are calling in, you need to hit star nine. And at this time, we open oral communications. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons wishing to address the commission on any matter within the jurisdiction of the commission and not on the agenda. Speakers are limited to three minutes. In most cases, state law will prohibit the commission from making any decisions with respect to a matter not on the agenda. Okay, I am looking at the list of attendees and at this moment, I do not see anyone with hands raised. Do we have any one, Madam Clerk? Ah, now I see. Okay, great. Um, so I see Henry Sang, Jean Bedord, and Richard Adler, and they wish to present together, beginning with Richard Adler, and they all have all called in in order. So I'm going to begin with Henry Sang. And since you are working together, I believe you're looking for the full nine minutes. Now this is for an item that is not on the agenda. Okay. Henry Sang, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. Are you looking for the nine minutes um, to be distributed three minutes per person, or do you want the yes. full nine minutes? Three minutes per person. Three minutes per person, but all in this the, the order that yes. you are here. Okay, great. And, and Beth, I had some slides. Uh, I gave you both the PDF or PowerPoint. You can display those. Sure. Okay. Henry, I'll start your time when she's got the slides up for you, okay? Certainly. Thank you. Okay, everyone should be able to see them, yes? Yes. Uh, 
Please hit the presentation button up top. Yes. Well, we'll give it a go. There you go. I can, I can see them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Woo. Are you guys still there? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead. Can I go ahead and start? Thank you, Madam Chairperson, Commissioners, and City Staff. My name is Henry Wu Sang Jr., and I'm speaking today as a member of Age Friendly Cupertino Task Force. My views and statements do not necessarily reflect the position of other organizations of which I am a member. We need serious conversations within Cupertino about our growing senior needs. Key among these are for a range of housing and support services specific to seniors. I'm coming to the Planning Commission as an advocate for the community to share our insights into the evolving needs and to ask your attention to these areas, encouraging studies and community discussions. Next slide, please. Shown in here is a qualitative analysis of our existing Cupertino housing options. Here we plot price against a set of options provided by a facility. As you can see, some places offer a very narrow set of options or located near the y-axis, while others offer a multitude of, of options. For example, long-term continuing care facilities have a mix of housing and services across the spectrum, from fully independent to fully dependent residents. Note that we have four options in Cupertino and a big gap, which we call the missing middle. While we have a foothold in some areas, such as the veranda for extremely low-income BMR housing, we are at a severe deficit in available units. Further, we are completely missing other BMR categories. On a whole, given the expected increase in the number of seniors in Cupertino, all areas are in deficit. Next slide, please. What are the missing elements? Well, here are some of the examples of the missing metal. Let's start with the missing types of other BMR. Some of our citizens rank as very low, low and even medium income, and they will need senior housing of appropriate pricing. Actually, we even need market rate senior housing. All of these types need designs that are specific for a range of senior conditions. Add to that the, uh, those types of independent housings, we also lack assisted living and skilled nursing rooms. Our service needs range from having a post-surgery rehab facility available after we get a joint replacement or open heart surgery to things like memory care, physical therapy facilities, and adult day daycare. By the way, adult day daycare is a very important for families taking care of elder relatives or a spouse taking care of their loved one, but it need an occasional hand. Even if you have a personal health care assistant, every now and then you need another option. Further, we need these options across a very wide range of price points. For most of us, we don't know about these things until something bad happens to our family. Then you scurry to find options. Will these choices be readily available when you need them? There is a veritable silver tsunami about to crash on Cupertino shores. We need to be aware and to plan for this. We strongly support the Planning Commission investigating and studying for our future needs for a range of senior living and service options. Age Friendly Cupertino is a volunteer advocacy organization and is willing to help. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Right. Thank you very much, Henry. So I'm going to restart the clock and bring in Jean Bedore. Are you there? Actually, I would prefer to have Richard Adlar come next and then me. Okay, okay, thank you. I will move on to Richard Adler. Richard, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me now? Um, I can. Good, and I also have some slides. All right, we'll let Beth get uh, your slide set up and then we'll start the timer. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So, uh, good evening. Okay, hold on. Let's Tell get me when all, to go. Let's get you all set. I don't want you to lose your time. I'm ready to go. All right, welcome Richard. Good evening and uh, thanks for having me tonight. My name is Richard Adler. I'm a 20 year resident of Cupertino. I'm also the chair of Age Friendly Cupertino Task Force and a member of the Santa Clara County Senior Care Commission. And um, Henry just talked about something called the silver tsunami. And I want to talk more about senior, uh, Cupertino's senior population and the need for more options for senior housing. We can go to the next slide. Uh, we, we can see that Cupertino already has a substantial senior population, but it's about to grow much larger. 
Currently, there are about 7,000 residents age 65 and older in Cupertino. They represent about 12% of the city's population uh, of just under 58,000. But by the end of the decade, the number of seniors in the city will grow to nearly 10,000 and will represent 15% of Cupertino's projected population. This means that while the city's total population is going to increase about 10%, over the next decade, the senior city senior population is going to grow by more than 35%. And that's the silver tsunami. Now, if we look more closely on the next slide, this is looking at the growth specifically of the 65 plus population. We'll see that the fastest growing segment will be what's known as the oldest old. So that residents in the 70s will increase more rapidly than those in their 60s and those aged 80 and above those were the best candidates for needing the services that senior specific housing can offer will grow most rapidly of all. Uh, and then the next slide, look at one facet that underlies the need, specifically the need for senior specific housing. It's the number of older adults in our community who live alone. If you look at all, all households in Cupertino, less than one in five is occupied by somebody who lives alone. But among the city's 65 plus households, more than half of them live alone. And finally, at the last slide, um, the reason this is significant is that studies show that older adults are particularly susceptible to what is known as social isolation. It's defined as a lack of social interaction, contacts, and relationships with family and friends and neighbors. And finally, press one more time, uh, and we'll see this is a quote from the National Academy of Medicine from a recent study said that social isolation significantly increases a risk of premature death from all causes, a risk that can rival those of smoking, obesity, and physical activity. So this is a, a, a serious and a growing problem. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And then Lastly, we have Jean Bedore. Jean? And I also have some slides. Okay, so we'll just wait a moment for Madam Clerk to bring your slide deck up, and then we'll start your time. Sorry, my computer is not behaving well. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chairman and commissioners and staff. My name is, my name is Jean Bedord and I've lived in Cupertino for over 30 years. I am president of the Cupertino Senior Advisory Council, but tonight I'm speaking as a citizen member of the age-friendly Cupertino Task Force. Next slide. Our community is aging, like it or not. Approximately one third of households in Cupertino have at least one resident over the age of 60. These households vary from boomers with aging parents to adult children living with their parents. Households with at least two older persons can function at a higher level, just because there's more than one person to share the task of daily living. However, one person households are particularly at risk for both social isolation and lack of caregiving. Cupertino in particular has a lot of large family homes occupied by one or two people with very limited options to move into more appropriate housing. These older adults want to stay in their community close to their friends and family where they have lived for 30, 40, or even 50 years or longer. They want to keep their trusted medical providers. The needs of older adults change over time. Today's vigorous 70-year-old will probably need more services after 80. Loss of a spouse suddenly turns the functioning two-person household into a single-person household with a bigger need for elder care. Dementia, which increases with age, has the same effect, with one spouse often moving to a memory care unit, leaving the well spouse as a single-person household. Next slide. There aren't many choices to make a housing change in Cupertino. There's 6,585 households with a resident over 60. When those residents need additional care, and many will need some type of long-term assisted living, there's a grand total of 584 units available. 
less than 10% of our older adult households. Furthermore, most of those units require buying into a life community, a CCRC. Where are the independent memory units? Where are the assisted living? Not in Cupertino. The upcoming RENA allocations will require the city to build thousands of new housing units. Given that older adults occupy one third of our households, shouldn't at least one third of those new units be some type of senior housing? Thank you for the opportunity to comment. All right, thank you, Jean. Okay, next I see Lisa Warren. Lisa, are you there? So I wanna thank the last three speakers. Um, and I, Henry was bringing up, as I heard him, many things, they all three did. Um, but what stuck out to me was the need for housing diversity for seniors. And mm -hmm. Hold on, I've lost Lisa. Hi, I'm back. Okay. Anything? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I don't know what was heard, but I, I agree with the last three speakers. Um, I, but what I want to add to that is some of what Henry was saying that I picked up was housing diversity is a very important thing. And it was echoed by the others um, for seniors. But I also just want to interject that Housing diversity is something we need for all levels of our community age in this city. And I've seen recently a lot of housing projects that don't look like they fit that bill. So just in the future, I would aim for the same thing of housing diversity, both in types and cost for all of our citizens, seniors and everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, I see no further hands raised for oral communications. Madam Clerk, did you have any written communications come in during this time? I am checking now. No, I don't see anything in our mailbox at this time. Okay. So we have nothing on consent calendar. We move to the public hearings, item two. And I'm going to read this entire section out. Uh, consider approving a development proposal to demolish 71,250 square foot retail center, the Oaks, remove and replace 74 protected trees and construct a mixed use development consisting of 267 housing units, 88 row houses and townhomes. 179 senior apartments of which 131 are senior licensed assisted living units and 48 are affordable or below market rate senior independent living units, 27 memory care licensed assisted living residences, memory care residences and 20,000 square feet of commercial space the applicant is requesting a heart of the city exception for retail frontage along Stevens Creek Boulevard. The applicant is also requesting a density bonus, including associated density bonus parking reduction and density bonus waivers for height, slope line setback and dispersion of BMR housing units. City approvals would be certification of the final environmental impact report, development permit, including findings regarding density bonus and waivers, architectural and site approval permit, tree removal permit, use permit, part of the city exception and vesting tentative map. Applicant application numbers DP 2018-05, ASA 2018-05, TM 2018-03, TR 2018-22, U 2019-03, EXC 2019-03, EA 2018-04, for applicants, KT Urban, Mark Trussini, location 21267 Stevens Creek Boulevard, assessor's parcel number two, I mean 326-27-042 and 043. Recommended action. Staff recommends that the planning commission conduct the public hearing, consider the evidence presented and recommend that the city council one, approve an environmental impact report 
support and to approve the application per the revised draft resolutions or three recommend denial of the project per the draft resolution and at this time first um, I want to mention that the public comments must be made at the public hearing, not during the commission deliberations. If there are any ex parte communications, uh, this would be the time to mention if you've made trips to the site and had communications with the public or the applicant, disclose any information you received that was not included in the packet and available to the public. Uh, would anyone like to mention any trips or conversations they've had with the applicant or members of the public on this item? Commissioners? Okay. Just for the record, I had no communications since the uh, prior hearing with any parties. Yeah, I would add to that. Uh, I've had no communication since our last hearing. And okay. I, I know previously that we had spoken about, uh, we had all visited the site uh, previously as was discussed in the May meeting. Um, did anyone else have anything to indicate? No. Yeah, no, nothing new beyond uh, the what we said last time. Okay, I, I do want to mention um, something that was in our mailbox for the uh, uh, the chair and the planning commissions. Um, the uh, Berliner Cohen letter dated July thirteenth, twenty twenty. I am wondering, um, does staff know if this is included in the attachments? I could not find it. That doesn't mean it wasn't there. I just could not locate it. So it's a July thirteenth email. No, Chair, that was not included. That was a uh, post uh, publication of our staff report. Okay, okay, understood. Um, so that would be one item that that, that would not be uh, available to the public, or is it? Would you happen to know if it's in the written communications? Because I don't recall. It, it it'll be made as a part of public record. Yes. It will be. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay, and then we now move on to the staff report. Uh, and at the conclusion of the staff report, we will ask our questions to staff. And after that, we will move on to the applicant presentation, which will last 10 minutes. All right, now for our staff report. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chair Moore, for that very detailed and uh, uh, clear uh, introduction to the project. Uh, the project, uh, the Westport project before you tonight is a uh, re revised version of the ones that you've seen on May 12, 2020. The city team here includes the uh, senior planner and project, ma project manager, John Martier, who will be doing a presentation for you. We have Barbara Kautz, our special counsel. We also have the city attorney's office present here as well as Seth Petta. And uh, obviously we're here for uh, available for questions and the project applicant team is here as well. With that, I will hand it off to uh, John Martier for the presentation. Thank you, Chair and Commissioner. Good evening, uh, Cupertino community and the Planning Commission and the public at large. I'm John Martier, I'm a senior planner with the City of Cupertino's Community Development Department. And I will start my presentation uh, right now. I think everyone can see that, correct? Well, good, all right, thank you. So again, this is the Westport Development at uh, 21267 Stevens Creek Boulevard uh, for the July 14, 2020 uh, Planning Commission hearing. Again, um, Chair Moore had read the subject already, so I'm not gonna bother going through this all. Uh, this presentation might seem a little bit of a deja vu because much of it's gonna be the exact same as you saw on May 12th. Uh, we will go in much detail about uh, what the changes are and, and the options that the Planning Commission has. Um, and we'll try to get through the other parts that haven't changed as much um, quite quickly as you've heard before. And, um, but of course, we'll be able, to, I'll be able to answer any questions that they at the uh, termination of the uh, presentation as well. So again, here are the applications. We have everything from uh, <clears throat> the EA for the, for the final environmental impact report to development permit, architectural site approval, use permit, best intent map, part of the city exception, entry rule permit. And I'll go through each of these applications um, throughout the presentation. Um, as mentioned, uh, initially the plan commission uh, did uh, receive uh, a prior version of this project on uh, May 12th, 2020. And at that hearing, um, the Planning Commission recommended 5-0 to certify the final, final environmental impact report and adopt resolutions approving the project. 
Around June 4th, 2020, the applicant submitted um, an amended project um, uh, officially, um, although there were discussions be before then as well that the applicant had a desire to amend the or modify the project, and we had let them know that they would have to probably go back to planning commission um, for that. So on June 4th, 2020, the application was officially um, modified and submitted to staff and these are the two major ones that the two major changes that we saw that necessitated the this project to come back to planning commission so the first was a relocation of bmr units to building two and uh, subsequently uh, the additional story added to to said building um so as you recall uh, building uh, one had um uh, 39 i'm sorry building two had 39 uh, bmr units and it was exclusively uh, BMR while uh, building one had uh, nine BMR units. Um, after the, the hearing on May 12th, uh, the applicant let us know that they were removing the nine BMR units from building one and transferring to building two and to, to, to have those, to accommodate those um, additional units, it would add an extra story to the building while at the same time um, removing the towers as was conditioned by the planning commission on May 12th. Um, so, uh, in effect, the, the height of building one it was reduced um, and the height of building two, although the towers were removed, the added story added about uh, three quarters of a foot to the building overall. Uh, further, the unit mix was, uh, was changed between buildings one and two, uh, building two um, to accommodate, and we'll go through this in more detail later on, to accommodate the uh, uh, commensurate a unit mix added, um, <clears throat> excuse me, added uh, two bedroom units as well. So uh, going back to the beginning, the project location, where it's located and, and the project basics. So uh, the project location is um, ordered by three streets, uh, Mary Avenue to the north and the, in the east, uh, Stevens Creek Boulevard to the south and 85, uh, Highway 85 to the west. As you see, it's surrounded by mixed uses with high density uh, residential to the north, um, <clears throat> public uses such as Memorial Park and the Senior Center to the east, and um, De Anza College to the south, uh, with the with Monta Vista over the over the freeway uh, to the west. Um, the Heart of the City Specific Plan uh, is part. It's within the Heart of the City Specific Plan special area, and it's governed by the Heart of the City Specific Plan. And this area is known as the Oaks Gateway. Um, the housing element identified this as a priority housing site um, and it was allocated 200 units based on a realistic capacity of otherwise 85% of the maximum capacity, which is which for this size about 30 dwelling units an acre. Uh, the proposed base density 237 units is consistent with what is allowed in general. plan. <clears throat> so uh, some of the project data about this again uh, building one um, no added stories to this is still a six story building. Um, with 167 senior residential units, 27 memory care license, assistant living residences, and 17,600 square feet of ground floor retail commercial space. Uh, building two went from five stories to six stories uh, with uh, 48 below market rate senior residential units and 2,400 square feet of ground floor retail commercial. Um, the layout and the consistency and programming of the uh, Row house and townhomes um, has not changed. You saw the 70 single family residential townhomes and 18 single family residential row house condominiums. Okay. Um, underneath the project on the Eastern side of it, you do have 187 uh, parking spaces at below ground, one level, uh, 44,945 square feet of residential common open space, as well as 2,900 square feet of commercial common open space. Um, 380, 386 on-site off-site tree replacements for the 73 uh, protected development trees that are proposed to be removed and replaced and relocated. Um, and you have the vesting tenant of match, which would divide the property into two separate parcels. Currently, the, the property is two parcels, but this would be uh, an adjustment of those lines to um, have more two equally sized parcels, with the one on the east um, being exclusively for the the, the, the senior development and the one in the West being exclusively for the townhome and row houses. 
So here's the uh, site plan uh, for the proposed development. You see the, the blue buildings right here are the mixed use. Um, so building one is 131 senior mixed use and uh, 27 memory care rooms. Building two, and you have the 48 unit BMR senior mixed use uh, uh, development right here. Then you have the 70 townhome condominiums, and then you have the 18 row house condominiums bordering right here on 85. Density, bo uh, density bonus waiver request. Um, so density bonus, so the, the applicants requested a density bonus, uh, or qualify this project as a density bonus project. And the density bonus is for very low income communities selected. And again, uh, when you use density bonus to, you have to pick from either one or the other, either very low income or low income. And so the, the, the applicant has chosen the very low income uh, for their density bonus. Um, the, Slightly over 20% of the units on site are density bonus, and that's again based upon the 237 uh, base units, not the not the 267 altogether. Uh, the applicant is entitled to the 35% uh, bump uh, per the density bonus ordinance uh, or any three units. However, the they they have requested 24% bonus or 30 units above the base density of 237 to have a, a total amount of 267 units on site. So the, the applicant, as part, of the, as, as part of them being a density bonus, um, they've asked for three waivers. Now, there's two types of ways that the density bonus ordinance works in terms of what you can, um, can request as part of um, flexibility and development standards. The first are incentives or concessions, which are uh, essentially you're limited to based upon your, your, the amount of uh, affordability, one to three incentives or concessions, which are really Flexibility development standards because of um, financial considerations, um, or you can you can do waiver, waiver requests, which are flexibility and development standards for physical preclusions, and this is explained in May twelfth as well. Um, and this and there's and these are unlimited, and so what the applicant has has asked for three of these waivers, um, and so what they have to provide is some sort of justification as to why. Um, certain development standards would preclude them from adding not just the base density and the affordable units, but also the density bonus units that they're requesting. So um, the three waivers are height waivers of is, is waiver of the standard in the general plan for the 45 foot height limit. And so building one would be uh, 79 feet, 79 and a half feet to the roof ridge, which is a, the, as we measure um, these, these types of structures all, all along Seams Creek Boulevard. If you're building two, it would be 74 and a half feet to the roof ridge. Uh, the slope setback from um, Stevens Creek Boulevard is one to one uh, from the curb line, and that's in, in the general plan. And um, the applicant is requesting a one to 1.7 for building one and a slope setback for one to 1.48 for building two. Uh, the third waiver request is for the requirement within the density bonus ordinance, which is that the four units be dispersed throughout the project. So um, just a, this is a quick table to show how the uh, just comparative in terms of what, what the physical changes for the waivers uh, were between what was presented on May 12th and what is was presented tonight. Again, uh, building one was presented uh, as 91.75 feet um, on May 12th. The applicants come back as they've eliminated the tower portions to 79.5 feet. Uh, building two, uh, again, Although they did, although you did take off the, the, the tower elements, they did add a floor. So the height um, slightly increased by three quarters of a foot. Um, the townhomes, row houses, no change to those heights or slope setbacks as well. Um, and you can see that the slope setback for building one has uh, decreased uh, from one to one to two point zero eight to one to one point seven zero, and uh, for building two is slightly increased, just marginally, um, to one to one. 0.4a from from 1 to 1.47. Um, so you can see right here um, the comparative in terms of building one, which is right here, and building two, which is right here. The one to one slope line is um, the per the general plan is right here in the, in the red dotted line, uh, where the blue line is what they are proposing. Um, again, here's the uh, BMR, um, the, the red line for the BMR units, and so the, and the blue line for the proposed. 
uh, would that would, would land as you can see that um, the one-to-one -one slope line would would infiltrate pretty much the uh the fourth level of the of building one and the fifth le level of uh building two So waiver justifications from the applicant. Um, in terms of height and slope setback, much of their justifications were design um, oriented. You know, having the taller structures with the higher density concentrated the eastern end of the site, um, which would allow for greater product mix. Um, one of, the, if you can, if you can recall from the site plan, um, the less intense uses, the single family uses, even the the Glenbrook apartments, which are although higher density, um, they are no taller than I would say 30 to 35 feet, if that. So the the so according to the applicant, that's a better transition to have the row houses and townhouses uh, concentrated on the western edge of the site to better transition with those those lower density, or lower intensity, lower intense um, neighborhoods along Mary Avenue. Um, if the according to the applicant, if the strict enforcement standards would would if, if the standards were strictly enforced for height and, and setback, um, it would require units to be further re relocated to parts around the site, uh, lose required open space, um, limit the height to buildings one to 45 feet would eliminate 102 senior units plus another 15 units in order to relocate the amenity terrace to a lower floor, and um, limit the height to building two to 45 feet would directly eliminate 18 BMR senior units from the project. Um, for the third waiver, um, what was presented the first time, again, the difference with the waiver this time than last time was uh, on May 12th. Was on May 12th, there was the BMR units were spread between the two buildings. You had 38 in building two, nine in building one. And so the first couple of, um, the first couple of bullet points here apply to both scenarios where um, consolidation of senior housing components adheres to the certain design requirements that are required per state and federal regulations that you know, senior housing um, cannot be designed the same way as non-age restricted housing, for example. Um, there's certain other requirements for, 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 um, for access and, uh, and, and, and challenges for um, ambulatory challenges to, to overcome. Um, however, the last two bullets um are unique to this th th this revision okay so as all the bmr units are um consolidated in building two um the applicant has mentioned that because the building one facility is programmed as a regular senior assisted living facility the service offerings operation costs and logistics um would not adhere to what's required for BMR uh, development. Uh, it's separate, um, a lot of financial considerations with that as well. Um, and further that the BMR units within building one uh, would not qualify for any type of low income housing tax credit program that would be able to subsidize the development of those BMR units. Um, so with the applicant's reasoning, that's why they are consolidate those BMR units or consolidate in building two. Um, again, like last time, we had the city's third-party architectural firm um, to review the plans, uh, both on, you know, prior to May 12th and both subsequent to May 12th as well with revisions. Uh, the conclusions were, were essentially the same. Uh, where, you know, we found that um, if we were to, if, if the applicant were, were forced to adhere to the height and slope setback um, waivers, uh, I'm sorry, um, development standards, that they would decrease the amount of open space and landscape areas to the point where they would have, they would be required to to uh, to have a waiver for that as well. Um, it would also reduce the average size of the units, um, reduce retail support space, including areas identified for trash, loading lobby space, uh, reduce commercial ceiling heights. Um, as you recall from the plan sets um, in building one, the ceiling heights for the commercial areas are 20 feet, and for building two, they're 15 feet, and decrease the above ground parking, increased underground parking as well. In terms of the dispersion waiver, the explanation provided by the applicant for why this is no longer feasible is, at least for, from staff's perspective, more of a financial one. 
the applicant cannot get the tax credit funding for the BMR units building one if they're mixed market rate units. Um, this might be sufficient for support for requests for concession, as you explain again, concession incentives are both financial um, reasoning for um, relaxing certain development or flexibility of certain development standards, while waivers, again, are physical um, uh, reasons for relaxing development standards. And um, at this point, the applicant has not submitted any requests for a concession. And again, um, to repeat, we, you know, we do find the rationale for consolidation of the BMR units um, as more of a concession, financial reason, rather than a physical preclusion. And so we, as staff, feel that not enough evidence has been, no, no, no request for a concession has been submitted and there's not enough evidence for a physical preclusion at this point, but we'll get to that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, unit comparability. Uh, so again, this, this goes back to what we talked about at the beginning of the presentation with the um, unit mix um, revisions. So um, one of the, one of the um, one of the standards that um, that the developer has to meet is that the there has to be some type of unit comparability parity between the, the BMR units and the and the marker rate units um, as well uh, that are dispersed throughout the project. Um, what does that mean design wise? Um, Essentially, they essentially should look the same, take up materials inside, quality, um, essentially no stigmas. Essentially, you can tell one from the difference between one from the other. If, if a resident were, or a member of the public were to walk into a BMR unit and then walk into a market rate, they shouldn't be able to, to tell the difference. And so uh, part of that unit comparability is the is you know, size of the units and the uh, mixed percentage. And as, as you can see that the mixed percentage between building one are pretty much identical um, between the studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms. Um, there is a slight difference between sizes um, between the units in building one and building two. The building, the units ac across the board in building one are slightly larger than the units in, in building two. Uh, the BMR manual does give some flexibility that the, that the units can be slightly different in size, um, you know, and that flexibility can be discussed by the planning commissions and approved by the city council as well. So uh, down to the use permit. So the a use permit is required for this project for two reasons. Uh, the first is that um, as this is a um, as a uh, as a priority housing uh, site, um, it's allocated a certain amount of units. According to the general plan, in the heart of the state specific plan, the housing element and the in the, the zoning ordinance, if a priority housing uh, site proposes um, units beyond that 85% uh, realistic capacity, then they are required to submit for a use permit. In this case, um, to get be between the 200 units and 237, that's um, consistent with the general plan, you have, to, uh, you have to file for a request a use permit or apply for a use permit rather. Um, I do want to uh, add and, and point this out that the applicant has submitted this application or protest because the maximum density for site as shown in the general plan is 30 years per, per acre. Um, further, uh, the memory care portion of building one is considered a residential care facility. And, and any residential care facility that has seven or greater residents in the residential zone requires a use permit. And that's consistent upon all residential zones in the city from single family to, to uh, multifamily residential zones. Um, Pursuant to, to CMC section 1920.020, um, no, no residential care facilities that have similar or more folks can, uh, or, or residents, I should say, cannot be within 500 feet of a similar type of facility. And uh, what we found is that the, there is no similar type of facility within 500 feet of, uh, of this. And further, they have to get any type of license approved from the state or county agencies and departments uh, prior to to uh, operations. Um, hard to see the exception. Um, again, as discussed on May 12th, this has to do with the amount of retail along Stevens Creek Boulevard. Um, they, um, they're proposing um, less than the 75% that's required on the frontage and less than the 50% what's required in the rear. 
Um, again, this was also an application that was submitted in, pro by pro in protest by the, by the applicant as well. Um, different interpretation of the, of the, uh, of the ordinance. Uh, the proposed layout is on top. As you can see, this is prepared by the applicant to show uh, where the retail is. So you see there's retail, um, of 40% of, of the frontage, uh, square footage frontage along uh, Stevens Creek Boulevard. And then you have, which is uh, where the retail is uh, required to be. And then you, you see how the uh, applicant has put uh, restaurant uses and retail, uh, other retail uses along Mary Avenue, which is not required to be. We had asked the applicant to come up with an alternative retail layout plan to show, well, if you were to conform to Heart of the City, what would it look like? And we found that it would look like this um, with retail basically along the corner of Highway 85 and, and Stevens Creek Boulevard basically on the on-ramp right there. And what we found was a square footage that we took that was taken from here. And this is essentially where the square on um, building three is where the square footage um, was was put that was different than the proposed retail layout. It, the, the square footage was, was very similar to what was along Mary Avenue, which is not along here in the re, alternate retail layout. So we found out that staff had found that the same amount of retail square footage is between both scenarios. And so rather than have it where it could be a dead spot along this area where it's not, where pedestrians wouldn't feel safe walking and there's no stop, virtually no parking of cars there um, low visibility from either side seems to be below the traffic. Um, we found that it would probably be more successful on Mary Avenue and, and you still get the same amount of uh, retail square footage as what would have been required. Architectural design, uh, you see this is the new, um, the revised uh, facade of, of, of building one and building two. Um, I know the applicant has provided a more robust presentation on the architectural design, but I'll touch a little bit about um, architectural features and, and whatnot right here. Um, so I provide two views. Uh, one is the view from Mary Avenue, which is this one right here. Uh, as you see, oops, sorry. Uh, as you see building one, it's right there. And the clouded areas are, are the buildings that had, had changed with the exception of the of these townhomes. Uh, building two. So again, if you're coming from south, if you're driving south along Mary Avenue, this is pretty much the facades that you would see. Um, then you have the townhomes and row houses. Um, in the foreground, this little gray area right here, kind of looks like a cloud. It looks like the um, De Anza College uh, parking structure and how it would, would relate to um, the townhomes in, in, the, in, the, in the background. The view from Stevens Creek, uh, looking from De Anza College, uh, you see building one, building two, and the townhomes and row houses. Um, quite a big difference in, um, in height. Tree removal and replacement. Development proposed to remove and replace 74 protected development trees. Again, um, as majority of these trees were planted as part of a development, uh, they are considered protected per, this, per the, uh, the tree ordinance in the, in, in the municipal code. Uh, 14 are coast live oaks with trucks ranging between 11 to 51 inches. Of the 14 coast live oaks, four will be relo relocated on site. Um, the applicants proposed to replace the removed trees with 386 trees. Um, 314 on site and 74 off site. And then we, we can see the required replacements and replacements right here. Um, they will be, they are required to, to provide, it, per the ordinance, uh, 104 24 inch box trees and three 36 inch box trees. However, they are providing 287 24 inch box trees and 17 36 inch box trees. Traffic analysis, circulation, parking analysis. Um, again, um, you know, our EIR had studied uh, traffic impacts and, and um, as part of it, we found that the, the difference between um, the, the existing conditions and um, what is what will be developed is a vast reduction in, 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 the, in traffic, uh, either total daily or the peak uh, morning and peak out peak evening trips. Uh, the city's density bonus ordinance allows for the applicant to provide a, a parking on site a reduction. Um, what, what, what type of reduction do we have? So we see that the, 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 the project is in compliance with the uh, density bonus. 
uh, to use alternative parking standards um, and by using the 0.5 uh, spaces per bedroom. They are required to provide only 383 spaces uh, throughout the whole project, um, but they are proposing to add 430, I'm sorry, 463 parking spaces. Um, the big diff, they, they meet the, the bare minimum for the, for the restaurant and uh, retail standards as well as the uh, memory care facility. Um, but what the, the big difference is they are actually providing uh, more parking for the townhome row houses as well as uh, added visitor parking, which is not uh, essentially required for the ordinance. Uh, the vesting tenant map, uh, you, which what we have is two uh, resultant parcels, one of 4.7 acres, which is the row house townhouses, and one is 2.1 acres, which are the, um, which are the, the senior portion of development. Uh, bike route, uh, which is similar to a class three, will be on the west side and access to cross development route between Mary and Stevens Creek Boulevard. Uh, Stevens Creek Boulevard upgrades uh, are, will include detached class four bike lanes and other improvements. Um, there was a condition of approval regarding the bus stop um, from the last um, um, the last uh, the last year on May 12th uh, that was added by the commission. We have added that to the uh, to the tentative map um, resolution as well. And I know that um, public works staff and the uh, and the applicants team have been working on a on a final, um, a final tentative map um, uh, sheet to to go over those those changes as well. So the project history, uh, going back to May seventeenth, uh, twenty eighteen, um, the desk one was first submitted uh, was deemed complete July twenty third, twenty nineteen. Um, on February twenty twenty, applicants submitted a senior enhanced alternative to this. Um, as a feasible alternative in the final environmental impact report, oh, also known as a final EIR. Uh, it, was, it was called the Increased Senior Housing Alternative. On April 22nd, the applicant had requested that the Senior Enhanced Alternative be considered as a proposed project. Um, again, not a lot of physical changes from the exterior, but programming this site. And again, we already gone over the differences between this version and, and, and that um, Senior Enhanced Alternative version as well. Um, the environmental review and EIR, essentially um, there were seven, um, seven parts to the, seven parts of, seven areas of CEQA that were, that were found to have potentially significant impacts. Um, most of them have to do with the construction phasing of the project, um, air quality, biological resources, which is the you know, nesting birds, tree removal, and then cultural, geological, uh, resources as well, um, in case anything's unearthed while uh, excavating the site. Um, noise, again, construction, sandy and cultural, tribal, res cult tribal cultural resources. And um, the last one is utilities and service systems in the wastewater, ensuring that, Cupertino, that, that the, the, the project doesn't go above uh, the Cupertino sanitary um, uh, thresholds. At its April 16, 2020 meeting, the Environmental Review Committee uh, determined on a 5-0 vote that the project may have significant impacts to the environment, environment requiring the preparation of the EIR for the City Council to consider certifying. And again, uh, the Planning Commission on May 12th had uh, recommended certifying the EIR. Uh, the EIR has not, uh, or any of the studies have not been amended since then, as most of the, as a, as a, um, as the modifications were not deemed uh, significant. Uh, we do have Terry McCracken from PlaceWorks um, in attendance as well. So if you have any uh, specific CEQA or EIR questions, uh, we, we could direct those to, to her specifically. So here we are in the EIR process. Again, um, we are at the Planning Commission meeting. Next step is to go to City Council to certify the final EIR. Um, Housing Accountability Act. Uh, we discussed this a little bit more in depth on May 12th. Again, because it's a housing project, um, it would be considered um, part of the Housing Accountability Act. Um, however, um, as a project is underlined the last bullet, as a project is not consistent with the BMR unit dispersion requirement, the city need not make these HAA findings if it denies or applies certain conditions to the project. So, uh, conclusion, uh, recommendations. So this is uh, discussed uh, in depth in the staff report, but what, what's next for, for the planning commission? What are we, what's, what's to be recommended to city council at this point? 
Um, the first is to recommend denial of the project. Uh, the project, and there's three, I'll go through the three bullet points right now. The project that's proposed is inconsistent with the BMR manual's requirement that BMR units be dispersed throughout the residential project. And again, this is because of the movement of the uh, 90 BMR units from building one to building two. The applicant's reason for not dispersing the BMR units building one is that such units would not qualify for funding for the income housing tax credits. Um, again, as discussed, because this reasoning is um, is financial, at least that's the way staff sees it, um, it would, this would require a conce concession or incentive, um, which has been defined in the density bonus ordinance, and the applicant has yet to submit a request for it, for that. And, and because the project is consistent with this development standard and does not qualify for waiver, the project could be denied. Approval. Um, so the the planning commission could recommend approval and certification of the EIR um, if the BMR unit design requirement condition of approval and development permit resolution is modified. And I underlined um, letter D at the bottom that says senior, and that would be out of the city, the senior BMR unit shall be dispersed between building one and building two. Um, this condition shall be deemed satisfied if building one contains nine of proposed BMR units. So essentially taking those nine BMR units and replacing back into uh, building one. A couple other, uh, um, a couple other uh, choices for approval. The planning commission could determine the project would be better with all BMR units in building two, and that there is sufficient information and record to support a concession for the BMR unit dispersion requirement, or that the planning commission could find that the BMR unit dispersion requirement physically precludes a project um, the Planning Commission could recommend that the city approve the project as proposed. And as stated in the, in the, um, in the staff report, if, if any of either of these two are the options that uh, the Planning Commission would, would like to proceed for the recommendation City Council, uh, staff would, uh, would request a, a short recess to go over the next steps and to how to, how to arrange the resolutions if, if that's the case. Um, again, we do have uh, Barbara Kautz, uh, that, who's, uh, who's an expert in density bonus law on the dais uh, with us to help advise us through um, your discussion of density bonus law and the, spe specific, and the specifics of this project and how it uh, relates to, um, to density bonus law. Um, one thing I do want to point out that there is an added condition of approval in the development permit. And this is in response to members of, um, of the community uh, we express concern about the phasing. You know, when what part of the project would, de would be developed first, or the other one, uh, are the BMR units to be developed? Um, how, how do we know? How are we assured that the BMR, the BMR units will be developed if uh, if all the other uh, market rate units are developed first? So we have this construction phasing uh, conditional approval which sets uh, certain thresholds uh, for granting occupancy um, for certain buildings on site. Uh, so for example, um, under uh, letter A right here, prior to granting a certificate of occupancy for buildings one and two, uh, the street and sidewalk improvements along Stevens Creek Boulevard and the street and sidewalk improvements along the interior roadway for parcels one and two shall be completed to the satisfaction of the city and approval of the foundation shall be obtained for at least 50% of the townhomes and row houses approved for, for parcel two. Again, we're not requiring that the row house and townhouse to be completed um, 100%, but at least to show some progress is being made to what the project was approved for. Um, in terms of outreach, the site signage, we did do a citywide postcard uh, mailed to each resident uh, more than 10 days uh, prior to the hearing. Um, illegal ad was placed in the paper at least 10 days prior to the hearing and public notices were mailed to property owners. Uh, the next step is uh, city council, August 18th, 2020. And that concludes my presentation. All right, uh, thank you, John. That was a great presentation. And right now we're going to be moving on to commission questions. Um, commissioners may ask questions of staff, primarily regarding factual issues and clarifications. After this, we will move on to the applicant presentation for 10 minutes. And then we will open it for public hearing, three minutes per speaker. So commissioners, do you have some questions uh, for staff?
Okay. Actually, uh, sure. so I'll Smith. ask one just just to prove that I was paying attention. Um, this may have actually been in the previous <laughs> in the previous uh, 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 in our previous hearing, but there was mention there about seventy four trees. This was in the the tree replacement plan. Seventy four trees, which were going to be off site, and I'm curious about uh, what exactly that meant. Yeah, where um, is that? <laughs> were they were they right on the? Are these on the adjacent land or? or sure, they uh, no, like not a problem. Not a problem. Let me um, you know, let me pull up my. I'll I'll share um, really quick the the plan sheet that shows it. Um, here we go. Okay, can you guys see that? Are you able to see that? Okay, so here's a plan sheet right here. Let me figure out how to scroll my, my screen. Um, so the Heart of the State specific plan has certain uh, uh, right of way landscaping that's required. And so that's what it means by offsite. So if you look over here on Stevens Creek Boulevard, you have a row of oak trees and other types of landscaping that's uh, proposed for this oak grove along this portion of Stevens Creek Boulevard. So when we discuss offsite trees, that's really what we're talking about. We're not talking about all the way in Rancho or or Inspiration Heights or planting trees on people's properties now. <laughs> um, even along Mary Avenue over here, you do see some, not oak trees, but you have uh, different species of trees where they think, I want to say are um, Chinese elms. That's it, Chinese elms. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Um, Commissioner Saxena, you have your hand up. Yeah, okay. So uh, the first um, comment or question I had was, I wanted to confirm that we are reducing the actual height of building one from what we had see, uh, seen the last time, right? So this is not the tower or anything, uh, but the final height is also going to be less. Uh, no, uh, so the, 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 the final height would be pretty much the same. So by removing the, um, I mean, so, let me step back really quick. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there are portions that are um, in, in the, the applicant will go through a more detailed presentation in terms okay. of the, the top floor, which has been uh, reduced to, for the reason, so they added the rooftop, almost like a rooftop terrace for the folks on, on, on level okay. six, which will um, enable um, people walking on Stevens Creek to see less of the top floor and only see maybe up to the top of, uh, of the fifth level. So in a sense, I mean, Technically, no, but in a sense, they've, they've reduced the massing of the top floor from, okay. from the prior version. This is good to hear. Um, so that's one thing I want to talk about. And the second thing uh, was um, about a greater clarification on the BMR dispersal requirements. I think uh, that seems to be an area of confusion. And uh, if you could just go over the slides. And the last thing was this. Are your slides also on the packet or in the packet you just have the staff report? Um, so the, the slides typically reflect the staff report. Um, okay. it, it, is a, it is part of the agenda if you go online, um, but mm -hmm. no, it was not part of the packet. Okay, so it's, okay. Okay, thank you. Actually, if, if I could uh, interject, I believe that uh, we received that as a update um, mm -hmm. along the way um, as a, as a okay. packet edition, but the public would not have seen that. Yeah, so. Uh, okay, are we going to we're going back to point two of um, mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Saxena's point in terms of understanding what the BMR disbursement requirements were. Sure. So the BMR dispersal is uh, is part of um, not only nineteen five six the density bonus ordinance, but it's also part of the BMR manual as well, and it, it requires that uh, for certain develop for, for for inclusionary um, BMR units on site that they be dispersed throughout. And again. It's, it's a stigma. It, it's, you know, the, the, the genesis behind it is that you, you know, you don't know which, 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 which units in the development are BMR mm -hmm. or whatnot. Um, on the, when this project was presented on May 12th, um, that third waiver was justified because the, the applicant made a choice to, to make the BMR units age restricted and you couldn't disperse it within the non-age restriction portion of the sites of townhomes and, and, and the row houses per his, ap per his application because of the certain state and federal uh, design uh, criteria that, um, that that are specific to, 
to the elderly, uh, elderly designed uh, or age restricted uh, developments. Um, and again, uh, the you know, Planning Commission um, voted, uh, recommended 5 0 to, to City Council for that. Um, the issue is now, you know, the, at least the way staff sees it, is that the, the waiver for dispersion has not been met. You know, the, it's not equally dispersed between two age restricted buildings. You know, building one is age restricted as well as building two. So the way that staff sees it is that they should be both um, dispersed, you know, between the two buildings. Um, at least there hasn't been a, proven to be a physical preclusion as to the reason why they shouldn't be dispersed between the two buildings. Hopefully that answers uh, your question. Got it. And, and just so that I'm up to date, and I think I'm a little bit rusty on the BMR rules. Um, do the units need to be identified ahead of time as well in terms of when you send in the application or, or is it post submission? Um, typically they do. Um, and, you know, in, in this case, they, you know, they had identified on the, uh, the site plan, you know, the BMR units is pretty easy. It's one building. Um, so, um, <laughs> you know, you could, you know, you, 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 you could identify the BMR units, um, as, as a condition, uh, as, as part of like a, a BMR agreement, like, like we have as a condition of approval on our development, um, permit uh, resolution that, you know, that there's a development plan that ensures that the units adhere to the standards that are in the, the BMR manual, as well as um, any other portion of the other code, such as these, the density bonus ordinance. Thank you, John. And Chair Moore, may I ask a separate question? I was just trying to follow up on uh, Absolutely. Commissioner Saxena's questions. Um, I just have one question, and it's really about the retail space and the use permit that's associated with that. Uh, I just want to know, if, is that a completely publicly accessible retail space, or is it kind of like a fake one, kind of like the one in Main Street? <laughs> you know, we're like, you know, you can't go if you're not an Apple employee, right? So that's the only reason I'm asking that. It's like, is it, so is it easy to access to everyone out there? So, and that's that, that's a great point, um, uh, uh, Commissioner Wang. Um, the the uh, we want one of the things we so. First, let me clarify, this is actually a part of the city exception, not, not part of the use permit. Um, the, the retail that's along Mary Avenue is going to be a functioning restaurant um, that's geared towards the, the residents of Building 1. However, the, you know, the, the operators of the building, of Building 1 and that restaurant had assured us that that would be open to the public. It's out, that was staff's understanding. And, and that's the reason why that when staff uh, analyzed the, the exception, we felt comfortable with with um, with supporting it because it, it will be open to the public. It will be so it will be used by the public and not be a fake uh, fake front retail. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it has happened. I just I'm just making sure we're okay. So. Yeah. yeah. I, excuse me, John. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Like how much square footage is uh, used for the cafeteria, and is it expected? And could you you know explain for us and for the public sure. in regards to memory care units? because they don't have uh, kitchens in them. Um, where, where are their meals being prepared and um, who will be using the, the cafeteria primarily? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Moore. The cafeteria, again, will be you know, used primarily um, by the residents of Building 1. And again, it will be open to the public as well. Um, part of the programming of Building 1 uh, as part of a, a, a licensed uh, care facility is that, the, that you know, part of their I guess the rent or the or the fees they pay monthly is that they get three squares a day um, uh, from the cafeteria. So most of their meals will be downstairs. Most of their meals will be downstairs. And, um, and one of the um, each one, unit within that um, each unit. Am I echoing? That, I'm sorry. Um, am I echoing? I'm sorry. Am I echoing? Let me let me try. Some. I'm sorry. Am I echoing? Let me, let me let me try. Some. I'm sorry. But let me just. Is that better? Am I still echoing? Well, I'll, I'll try to power through this. Um, so the, in terms of the memory care, now the memory care um, rooms will, will not have their own kitchen. Uh, they, will, they will be um, limited to, um, there will be a kitchen facilities on that floor. Uh, floor uh, I, think, I think it's, I believe it's floor two. Um, and they will be served meals in those areas as well. Um, I, 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 I don't know if they're, I'm sure they, they will be offered to, Part of their 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 um, the rent or their their fees that they pay monthly, they'll be their, their meals could be open to the the ground floor um, restaurant as well. Uh, but they would they do have separate eating facilities uh, catered to them specifically. Great, I, I, Chair Moore, may I ask one more question? 
Yes, of course. Vice Chair Wong, please. Uh, yeah, so, so one last question, and I think I missed this, maybe in the earlier one, but it's just something that could be a positive here. I'm just trying to figure out what the, the tax or the additional revenues to the city would be for adding uh, this property or this, uh, so whether it's through property taxes, which we don't get, but you know, retail taxes and some of the other places. Because I think if I remember healthcare facilities don't, don't pay any tax, I think taxes directly, or I can't remember how that works. Um, unfortunately, that's not analyzed as part of this uh, portion of it. Um, so I don't okay, have- Okay, we'll wait when the applicant presents, we'll ask them, they might know. Thank you. Um, I have a question perhaps for our, for our attorney and um, it has to do also with the BMR units. And I'm wondering why we are not required to have the BMR units in the row houses and townhouses and why, uh, why are they uh, strictly in the senior units. I understand that you're, if you have senior BMR units, they will be in the senior buildings, but I don't, I don't understand why no um, BMRs in the market rate uh, larger units. Would anyone like to explain that? <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> so the city uh, initially in analyzing the project felt that the project description uh, was that the developer wanted to provide senior BMR units. Um, it would be the, the standard in the BMR manual is that the units need to be dispersed throughout the project. So the city could take the position uh, or the planning commission could recommend to the city council if it wished that the units should be uh, dispersed, you know, somewhat evenly in all types of the buildings. Um, physically, you know, physically, the units would not be precluded. Right. The, you know, what, what the BMR units require is they're cheaper. They're not physic. They don't need to be physically different. You know, uh, applicants often make them somewhat smaller, uh, somewhat, somewhat lesser materials, but physically, it's really has to do with the rent of the buildings. So it would be within, if, if the commission feels that, or believes that the policy is that the units should be in all types of buildings, you would have that authority to make that recommendation to the city council if you wished. Um, you know, the issue, the issue probably why, uh, why the applicant has proposed it this way is probably financial, you know, in the same way that the issue with the with putting the units in the in building one is it appears to be primarily financial. <clears throat> I mean, there's no reason that you couldn't have a senior building that had a mix of affordable and non-affordable units. Except except a financial reason again. <laughs> okay, and then in the same vein, there's no there would be no reason why the row houses and townhouses could not have a similar sized BMR unit. Right, except a, right. Except Physically. Financial reasons, okay. Yeah. All right. If, if you did have them in the, for sale, uh, in the for sale units, they would be moderate income units, however, rather than low income units. Um, and that's not- so moderate, moderate, median, yeah. That, that isn't clear um, to me or what is for sale. Um, now, yeah, the, yeah, the, uh, the townhomes and row houses are the for sale units, right? So those, okay, so the, they would be moderate if if it was a BMR. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, Commissioner Takahashi, thank you, Barbara. Uh, Commissioner Takahashi, are you speaking? Um, I was muted on, on both my phone and the Zoom. So anyway, um, first okay. question is, do we have any renderings of uh, version one, previously approved versus revised version? To kind of see the difference um, with regard to the towers, elimination of the towers, as well as the, the added um, floor on the second building. Is there any graphic that we could see before and after? John? 
Sorry, my cursor was <laughs> my mouse is not being, being difficult. Uh, yes, I let me pull up the. Yeah. <laughs> let me pull up some diversion. That would be that would be helpful, just so we can kind of have a visual comparison. Here's, um, I, do, I don't have one that's one next, right next to the other. I know that the applicant does have a, as part of their application, do have a side by side of it. Okay, but right. here's, here's what you, if you can recall from what you saw this in the yeah. agenda packet, you see that the towers are quite prominent, whereas you don't have that right now. So I mean, that's. that's Pretty much it. I, I would ref, I would defer to the applicant's presentation okay. for that. They, right. they do but it sounds job. like um, the building two now is uh, three quarters of a foot higher than the tower that's shown in building two. Correct. Correct. So it's okay. Pair of it. All right. Um, so the reason stated was tax credit um, issues associated with the original proposal um, of the nine units in building one. It, um, is there, can, does, what's the assessment of that in terms of the legal reason, the tax credit? Um, I assume there's a tax credit that, that the applicant can no longer um, take advantage of. Um, is, is that, is, can somebody on staff tell me why, what, that, what that element is that, that uh, prohibits the applicant from getting this tax credit? I um, the main rationale for the move. Uh, you know, the Oh, I would defer to Barbara Counts on, on this one. However, you know, I, I do want to say that the, again, they, they didn't require, they, it was just briefly discussed and you know, typically the, the applicant would try to, would, would have to provide that rationale as well. But I'll let Barbara continue. Yeah, I mean, uh, practically you can only get tax credits for a, pro for a project, generally one, they generally prefer projects of 40 units or more, but you can only get them for a, a particular project. You cannot get tax credits for a few units, uh, a few units, a you know, in a larger building. That's correct. Okay, so so really, it, it's to turn building two into completely BMR, which gives would that that's where they would get the tax credit versus most of the units in building two being BMR would not they would not gain a tax credit. True. I mean, they were proposing. They were proposing nine units in uh, building one. Right. Uh, oh, you mean you're saying if most of the units were. Well, right, right, right. So, so there's, 40, there's 48 units in building right. two. And right now, as proposed, they're saying they want all those to be BMR versus previously, I assume that it was 48 and uh, minus nine were BMR or um, uh, 39 were BMR previously. Uh, you know, that I'm not sure about, <laughs> but okay. it would be unusual right. to have a building that would be, you know, 75%, if you like, uh, affordable. Generally, the tax, the tax Credit Allocation Commission gives the most points. It's a very competitive process. There's many more applications for tax credits than tax credits exist. I should explain that my law firm does a lot of affordable housing. It's not really my, uh, <laughs> my wheelhouse, but... You know, I'm generally familiar with it. Um, so it's a very competitive process, project, process. Generally, the projects that get funded have the most affordability, i.e. the deepest affordability. They're usually required to have ex some extremely low income units. Um, tax credits will not pay for anything that's above 60% of median income. So, so they have been there have been a few sort of mixed income projects, but it's not very typical. And almost almost always the project that gets tax credits is entirely uh, a low income or below project. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, I, I, I guess, I mean, based on kind of staff's recommendation and um, the, it, I mean, there's all, 
there's so many incentives to, to build BMR housing. Um, generally speaking, the bonus density bonus is, is, is the best example, obviously. Um, and, and it's a need that the city has identified and, and, and supporting. Um, yet now we're um, recommending not supporting a BMR project um, because I assume it's a federal tax element, federal tax law. That's, that seems a little um, um, strange in terms of, of distribution of the BMR units because I think we're going to be faced with a decision with regard to um, disbursement of BMR versus the actual t- need for BMR and which is greater and which is a better um, serves the community. Um, and so I'm interested just to understand the financial elements associated with the, um, the tax credit and I guess what the, the city's general thinking is with regard to um, how this project would move forward. Is it a, a try again or go back to the original, lose the tax credit and, you know, that's, that's, that's the way it is. Um, so those, that's, that's my last question. Thanks. No other questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if I could, I'll start off trying to answer uh, Commissioner Takahashi, and then Barb, you can you know, clean up what I say or or add on um, with the clarification. You know, this is it, it's it's a matter of profit to uh, Commissioner Takahashi as well. You know, we 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 couldn't find the physical preclusion, which was the reasons that they wanted the waiver for dispersion. Um, again, we we were comfortable with the dispersion when there was nine units in building one and uh, you know 39 in, uh, in building two uh however as as they're all going to be as they're all consolidated in building two you know the waivers we couldn't we couldn't see the physical preclusion in, 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 the, in the rationale for the waivers you know financial financial preclusions financial um you know incentive financial issues sure but there was never a request for an incentive or concession it was just a request for a waiver, which is physical. Now, you know, with the uh, incentives or concessions, there's certain certain parts of the application, certain documents that you have to submit. You know, it could be anything from pro forma to some type of other fiscal analysis um, that would support the reasons why those units have to be consolidated to be able to build them. And that, and that was never put forward by the applicant himself um, themselves. So, so that's what we're stuck with. You know, had this been applied for a concession or incentive with the appropriate documentation supporting that request, I, we, we could be having a different conversation at this point. So, John, John, are you recommending that as a as an approach for applications like this in the future, including this one, but just in general? It, de- it depends on the reasons why the applicant is doing that. I think it's, it's it should be handled on a case by case basis. Thank you. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to what John said. I think the um, the issue that the staff's been struggling with is that they've talked to the applicant several times about uh, the fact that this particular waiver really is a financial way is is because of financial reasons, not because anything physically prevents um, the units from being uh, from being spread around. And for whatever reason, perhaps when the applicant makes a presentation, you can ask why they have not. Um, applied for a concession. Um, I I have a pretty simple question um, regarding the uh, calculation of the base density. And um, I just want to clarify, you used um, 7.9 acres uh, times the 30 dwelling units per acre. And the 7.9 would be, I believe, after there was a dedication um, or a roadway easement, is that correct? And I want to know if, if that's some policy that the city has that um, if a project is dedicating land to a, to a street, to a roadway, do you then uh, go for the, use the, the lower number um, in order to multiply it um, by the density? So that's, that's a great clarifying question, Chair. Um, it's one that we have to answer every day when it comes to FAR and, and lot coverage, even for single family homes. Um, so the, the definition of a net lot or a lot area is, is, is based on the net lot area. 
which is the existing lot minus any type of easements for the waterways, drainage, and, um, and, and, and any type of pedestrian or, or vehicular easements as well. And again, we, those are for existing. That, you, can, you count for the existing easements, not the ones that are in the future. So, so we wouldn't discount the, as an example, we're, we're adding as part of this uh, bike pad easements and whatnot. You wouldn't take that off of the 8.1, but you would take off of the existing roadway easement that's along that kind of that follows uh, Mary Avenue, um, which, which gives, gives you that delta between the, the 8.1 and 7. Okay, so what if there was some required uh, roadway widening? Would that make any difference? Um, not when calculating the density. If, okay. if, if this was, if you were calculating, if, if you had an FAR restriction, uh, yes. So, for example, if you're building on, again, off this project, if you're building a single family home in, in an R1 neighborhood and you have a 12,000 square foot lot, you got to dedicate 2,000 square feet to the street, you base your FAR for that home on 10,000 square feet, not the 12,000. Um, but when you calculate density, you base it off of the, of, of the net lot. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go through quickly because I had some notes on some of these um, slides from your presentation. Um, so you had 200 and 267 um, units. Uh, so you they qualified for 83 density bonus units. They requested only 30 units above the base density of 237, resulting in 267. The memory care units, you have 27 of those, which do not count as the unit count. So we don't get to the 294 anymore like we did previously. It's it's actually 267. So is that was that kind of like a, a discovery that because there weren't kitchens in the memory care um, units? Uh, yes. And you know, unfortunately we had a we had discussions um, with HCD and the Department of Finance um, subsequent to May 12th, um, just to see, you know, how they would would they would this count as Rena, would this, you know. But you know, and, and, and whatnot, and, and no, and you know, and, wow. and, and looking at the, the floor plans for the um, you know, for the uh, the memory care, you know, it was it was it was realized that there wasn't even a kitchenette inside, um, and for good reason. Memory care, you typically don't want someone with dementia to have a kitchen inside the house, uh, inside their, their rooms. Um, so, unfortunately, that was discovered um, after uh, after the May 12th hearing. Okay, um, and moving along through the slide deck very quickly uh, and the density bonus waiver request, you have um, the cross sections showing the one-to-one -one setback. Sure. And I was just curious, um, I couldn't zoom in and, and have enough clarity on the, on the distance. It looks like the setback from the existing curb for each of the buildings is around 43 to 44 feet to the building's right. front. Okay, but if I look at the one-to-one -one setback line, what my question is, is what is the, um, what are, what are they losing? You know, how much setback should they have had had there? It looks like, like, um, oh gosh, it possibly 30 more feet um, for your, the cross section on the left and maybe 20 for the one on the right. Um, so I was wondering if, if that, if I could be told what those, what the difference is as opposed to being given the, um, the slope difference. So you're you're asking if, if they're only thirty five feet, which is required for the 40, setback. The forty five foot height. Right. You know, I just answered my no, I didn't. That's yeah, there's something something odd about this. Do you want me to pull up the uh, the exhibit? Okay, so I, I I see. So if they want basically, so if they want to, wanted to keep it at the same height, they would actually have had to push it back another thirty feet. Is is what I'm getting at? Yeah, yeah. If there was no, if there was no height limit, and they were allowed to just be within the one to one, they would have to be further back. Right, right. I just, just so that people understand that 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 difference okay good um 
and the financial one. Okay, and then to clarify with the unit comparability, average unit size, two bedrooms is 843 square feet for your BMRs and 1,087 square feet for your um, uh, building one uh, market rate. Uh, that, that could actually mean another bedroom or two almost um, for a small size bedroom um, is lost. Is that a, a good ballpark uh, comparison? Uh, uh, ten bedroom, small bedroom. You know, they. I mean, they, it would be. I mean, I don't know the logistics of a floor plan, but it's you know it's hundred probably one hundred and sixty square feet, which could be, yeah. I mean, a small bedroom if you want to have it comparable to something. Okay. Okay, and then the last thing. Uh, there was. Um, I had a question about the extra parking. If you could, they have, it looks like 80 extra spaces. Um, could you please just remind us where those extra parking spaces are located in the on site? So, I, I, yes, so uh, the townhome row house parcel is, is a bulk of the extra spaces, uh, mainly because um, they would be required. So if you have a three bedroom, you're required to have a, a 0.5 spaces per bedroom required to have one and a half spaces uh, per per unit. What they had done was uh, dedicate two spaces, two garage spaces per per home, and then 30 uh, visitor spaces, which is not a requirement at all. Okay. Um, I bring that up because I didn't notice in the RRM analysis that that the parking was, was looked at um, when they looked at their different scenarios. Okay, are there any other further questions from the commissioners before we move on to the applicant's 10 minute presentation? I had one if I could. Uh, there was some discussion earlier. I'm sorry I had a, a technical difficulty, but uh, back. Um, so I'm just curious, was there, was there a direct discussion about waiver versus concession between the staff and the applicant? Uh, for about a year and a half, two years, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it's 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 a pretty common discussion when we talk about density bonus um, in terms of you know, especially when you're looking for development standards, uh, flexibility with development standards as well. Um, I shouldn't say year and a half, two years, but it, it has been discussion, you know, uh, at the time of application and and especially more recently with the with the revisions to the um, the plans. And and then just to be clear. Uh, is your position that were this to be have been presented as a concession rather than waiver that that would be granted for, for the reasons given if it was uh potentially okay thank you okay i'm seeing no further questions from the commissioners we will next move on to the applicant's presentation, which will be 10 minutes. And uh, at the conclusion of that presentation, the commissioners may ask questions. And after that time, we are going to move on to the public hearing. So is, has the applicant, uh, is the applicant prepared to yeah, show yeah. The This is Andy Faber, and we're gonna do what we did two months ago and split up our presentation. Um, it, it, listening to these questions, by the way, we, we have answers to a lot of the things you asked. I don't want to go into it in my share of the 10 minutes, but I'll be happy to answer questions. Um, uh, many of the questions you've asked of staff, we do have, have answers and explanations for. I would like to share a screen. We submitted um, three PowerPoints that are PDFs. Uh, and if I can share, I'm allowed to share a screen, I think. So let me try to do that. All right, as soon as you have your screen share, I'll begin the 10 minutes. I'll stop okay. it in your speakers. You have 10 minutes total, okay? Okay, so let me just make All sure, right. is, is my screen being shared? Yes? yes? Is the screen up? Yes, the screen's up. Okay. Welcome, Andrew. Okay, thank you very much. And to answer uh, Commissioner Takahashi's question, this is the before and after. Uh, the top is the project as you, buildings one and two, as you approved it unanimously two months ago, and the bottom is the proposed changes. It takes a sharp eye to really see the changes, frankly. And that's the reason I'm showing this slide as a lead off slide because 
really we've made very, very few changes and somehow staff has ballooned this out of control into something that has major legal implications. They think, we don't think it does at all. The only change really are removing nine units from one building to the other. And there's some related architectural changes which the architects can explain and there has already been some discussion of them. Um, the, the issue that staff has brought up, which is bizarre, is this dispersal concept. And the, your code says that BMR units shall be dispersed throughout the project. The, they were originally in building two, not in the row houses and townhomes, and that had been accepted by staff going back to 2018, frankly, because they're senior affordable units and they can't be interspersed. And I think Barb Couts would agree with that. Um, how, however, um, the purpose of dispersal is to disperse affordable units into market rate unit projects and into market rate unit areas so that there isn't a stigma that, oh, you're from that other one. Uh, the problem with this project, it's not a problem, but there is no other market rate component to this project. And building two is a senior regular apartment building. People pay rent. It's all going to be affordable. And by the way, I should add that of the units, we're producing 20%. That's 33% more affordable units than are required, which is only, we're only required to have 15%. So the project should get some credit for the fact that we've got these additional units. But in any event, building one is not a market rate apartment building. It's a state licensed residential care facility for the elderly. By law, it must provide services, three meals a day, housekeeping, assistance with life activities such as bathing and hygiene, taking medicine, night supervision. And residents pay for all of that. They don't just pay a rent. There is no way to calculate an affordable component for these units, frankly, because these are bundled fees that a resident pays. And by law, everybody in, the, in such a building has to receive those services and has to pay for them. And Atria can explain that more to you if you have any questions. So in fact, we think it's very clear, and this is the subject of the letter I wrote yesterday. And although I only wrote it yesterday, it's in response to the staff report we only got Thursday afternoon. So we're trying to be diligent. Uh, the dispersal concept just doesn't apply to building one because it's not a market rate product. So staff saying that we violate it, we believe is simply incorrect. Now you've been uh, taught before that there are two kinds of laws that apply, the Housing Accountability Act and City Bonus Law, as you know, and we've had people uh, lecture you about them. Uh, the Housing Accountability Act says you can only apply objective standards and you can't come up with a redesign of the project just because you'd like a different design either. Uh, dispersal of EMRs is not an objective standard. The staff report says it is, but it's not a defined term. There's no standards for dispersal, either in your code or in your BMR manual. There's no discussion of what dispersal actually means. And there's certainly no discussion of how it might apply to something that isn't a market rate component of the project. In other words, how it would apply to a residential care facility for the elderly, which is what building one is. So in fact, all of this discussion of dispersal, I believe is beside the point. Uh, the Housing Accountability Act also says that if we have a debate between a developer and a city as to whether a project is in compliance with the city standards, the developer wins. It's kind of harsh to put it that way and cities don't like to hear that and I don't blame them. But the state set up that standard two years ago to say, if a reasonable person could think that the interpretation of the developer is correct, then the court will go along with that. That reverses the longstanding typical municipal law that says cities are given great deference to their interpretations. Uh, finally, the density bonus law, there is a reason for waivers. There are financial reasons that were discussed, but in addition, uh, a comment was made at the last commission meeting about whether we needed more space because of COVID-19. And in reanalyzing the project, and Atria and the architects can talk about this, they found that yes, they did. They needed quite a bit more space for housekeeping, for staging of meals, for storage of supplies, for all kinds of things, and for common areas that are changed now under the, in the current pandemic. So they had to take something out of building one. And without, since we didn't want to change the envelope and make it a seven story building, um, that meant turning some residential square footage into essentially common area and what they call back of office space. So they did that. And that means that 
fewer residential units could be in building one that in turn means that in order to keep the license to count the same and with the same amenities as proposed by the developer the dispersal standard if it were interpreted as requiring affordable units in building one would have to be waived it would physically preclude making the uh, project with the proper unit count for the rcfe and with the amenities as designed so that actually is a justification for the waiver even though our primary position is we don't think the waiver requirement applies because the dispersal requirement doesn't apply. So just to get back again, um, this is this is all we're doing. We're changing from this thing on the top to the thing on the bottom. It's a very, very minor change. And uh, it really should hardly occupy the Planning Commission, I would think, because it's not a different project except in one little detail. Anyway, that that's my approach. And I'd be happy to answer questions. But uh, as part of our 10 minutes, I'd like to turn it over to Randy Beckerman from Atria Senior Living, who I think also has a, a, a share. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. All right. Um, so I just want to let you know you only have three minutes and 26 seconds left. Please pull up your presentation and you'll need to finish up in, in this allotted time. All right. So if you have a third speaker, you're going to need to figure out how you're dividing that time between the two of you. All right. Can, can, I apologize. Can you hear me? I think I went over what I should have done. I meant to do to speak faster, but I tried to respond. And we do. We would like our architect to talk also if there are questions. All right. Um, so again, you have three minutes and twenty six seconds, and that is your time amount. All right. Is your slide deck up? It, it is, Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Randy. Please begin. Sure, I will skip this slide as we discussed it the last time, but Atri Senior Living, one of the uh, largest and highest quality operators in the country. Um, and, and I think this slide is actually uh, somewhat helpful to set the landscape for what the product actually is. Um, you know, what Atria tries to accomplish is to provide licensed assisted living and memory care services and housing. Um, and uh, you know, this building itself, Building 1, will be licensed by the California um, Department of, Social, Sur of uh, Social Services for the provision of assisted living and memory care services. Um, it will not be a CCRC, as mentioned before, so it will be a rental product without buy-ins. Um, and as per DSS licensure requirements, um, rent is bundled, as Andy mentioned, and we do need to provide um, three meals a day, activities, transportation, and housekeeping to our residents. Uh, we will provide memory care services to residents, and that happens within a secured area of the building for our residents' uh, safety. Um, and then sort of within the spectrum of senior housing, you have the left-hand side, which is age-restricted housing, independent living, which is not what uh, building one is. Uh, building two is more akin to uh, what you see as sort of active adult or age-restricted housing. Um, and as you move from left to right on the spectrum of senior housing, um, obviously the operational intensity, the staffing uh, requirements um, are all increased. And I'll uh, yield my time at this point and answer any questions you have um, after. All right. Um, thank you, Randy. And your next presenter... It's, it's, it's Stephen Olhaber here. Do you know how much time I have left? Minute 40. Okay. Um, let me share my screen and start. Hang on a second, please. Can everyone see the, the first slide? Um, yes, Stephen. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'll be really brief and quick since a lot of this information has been covered already. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, so uh, we were reacting uh, to some of the comments from the prior meeting, reducing the height, removing the towers for the buildings, um, particular in Building 1, uh, trying to pr provide some type of planning for COVID-19 or similar type uh, quarantine impact on the operations, and then uh, try to create parity among uh, Building 1 and 2 in terms of unit type and mix. 
Um, the responses came in terms of with the moving of the nine units from building one to building two, it allowed us to um, remove the towers for, for both the buildings, in fact. Um, and then also in building one, the movement of those nine units over allowed us to replan the amenities to the rooftop space at building um, one at the top floor and allows us to um, push back the building face at the top of the building. So it, it reduces the uh, physical impact and a perceived height along Stevens Creek Boulevard for um, people uh, moving along the, the frontage of the street. Um, we also created additional back of house zones for quarantine operations. This is mainly for staging staffing, for uh, PPPE materials. Also, um, when they do, when they're in quarantine mode, they also have to do staging and meal distribution. They don't um, have people going down to the cafeteria restaurant area, so they need space for that. And then creating similar unit types between the mix between buildings one and two. So uh, creating two bedroom units in building two and also adjusting the uh, mix um, in the buildings. Um, John mentioned the mix size and new comparison, so I'm going to skip through that. This is just a side-by-side -side comparison of the typical floors. This is level one. The previous version's on the left, the new version's on the right. There really is no pertinent change on there. Um, this is level two, and you can see we had amenity areas in level two. They're now moved up to the sixth floor, and that's infilled in with uh, the units. We've also included um, this uh, preparation and storage area for staff and housekeeping has been enlarged to over 500 square feet per, um, per story to help with the distribution and uh, management in a quarantine mode. Please, um, this is for, wrap up. I'm always, okay. I'm sorry? You need to wrap up. Okay. Um, so the, the high points here probably are best shown in the um, perspective. So I'll flip through it since uh, Commissioner Takahashi was asking about that. So if I just bounce between the two slides here, you can kind of see the pertinent changes. Building one, the removal of the tower, the setback of the upper stories, and building two, the removal of the tower, but the addition of the other story on, on that building. And these are just a couple um, quick shots here of the two differences, and that's basically it. So thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Stephen. Okay, so uh, commissioners, if you have any questions, of the applicant or if you need to ask um, any questions of staff in response to seeing this presentation, please do so. Any questions from the commissioners? Okay, uh, Commissioner so Tucker. I guess I do have one. I, I'm surprised nobody else did. Um, I'm curious uh, what the applicant's position was with regard to the um, development permit that was uh, proposed in the uh, staff report the staff presentation. This is basically re related to the staging of the production of the, the uh, two buildings and two roadways and such uh, for the entire project. Great, uh, Commissioner uh, Fung, I can answer that question if you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, um, and before I answer that question, <clears throat> I think it's a perfect time to, to address why it is we're back in front of you this evening and, I, and i'd like to get to that if anybody's interested because it was my decision to put the affordable units in building number one and i and there's a, a lot of background behind that but i want to address the comment the the phasing of the project we're looking at that right today with the utilities with the design with the street infrastructure i have no issues whatsoever on the street infrastructure and building to the garage of building one and two, they go together. The townhomes, as we envision it, will be built uh, first. Uh, that's the, it seems to be the natural course of the, of the development. The townhomes will go first, but the building number one <clears throat> and two, and when I'm mentioning two, is the garage portion of building two, will be built at the same time. We will not build the structure of building number two until such time that we have the adequate financing in place for that. And as was mentioned previously, one is uh, in competition with a number of projects uh, throughout the Bay Area uh, for the needed uh, funding from um, different sources there. We will apply for those, that financing as, as expeditiously as we can. We're working with related on the affordable side of the project and they manage in excess of 10,000 residential units and they're very equipped in, uh, with the abilities to attract the, the right financing for the project. So I'm comfortable that we're gonna go forward, but uh, if I'm answering your question correctly, 
I'm not comfortable with the phasing aspect of the project as far as a set requirement, because the last thing I want to do is build building number one for the assisted living units and not be able to turn those over for occupancy due to a delay, which is out of our control because we do not control those funds. So that's what we'd like to do. I'm, I'm perfectly fine establishing the time frame of which to address the so staff can be uh, aware of where we are and how our progress is coming along. But that's just one thing that uh, uh, we, we cannot agree to. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Takahashi, your hand is raised. Yeah, <clears throat> I guess I'm, I'm looking for the city's response to um, the applicant's um, point about building one really is not a, a, a market rate rental building. It's, it's an assisted living facility and therefore should be, uh, should not require dispersion because putting a, uh, which there's some sense to this <laughs> from my perspective, putting an affordable unit in the middle of an atria facility does seem um odd if you will so i guess i'm just looking for the city's perspective on that i mean yeah i may i might say initially that the developer is claiming all the benefits of the housing accountability act and density bonus waivers for building one and then arguing that it's not housing for the purposes of the dispersal requirement beyond that though it's actually not uncommon to have affordable units in assisted living projects. It is possible. It is a, a you know, financially it's, it, it can be a problem, but there's a specific uh, federal program that provides tax exemptions for assisted living projects that include a, a, at least 10% very low income, uh, very low income units. I worked with a project uh, representing the city in the city of Millbrae uh, the project was near the end of the 15-year affordability project, but that project had 158 units, of which 32 of the units were rented to very low-income households. So it's not something that that cannot be done. In terms of calculating the rents, in that particular project, they calculated what portion of the bundled payments were, you know, uh, ascribed to what you might call rent, and then that the rent was set at the affordable price. And I, I, I don't th believe that they controlled the service costs. Another way I've seen it done is that, uh, again, the rent is pulled out, but there's some limit, some total limit on the service costs for the affordable units. So it's not right, something, but, but, you know, for, but instance, that for instance, like 75% of income. So it's, I understand it's problematic. The the uh, built the owner is subsidizing, you know, those affordable units. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Um, but but it's not it's not that those assisted living do not contain, um, you know, cannot contain affordable units. Again, it's a financial problem. It's not it's not. A physical problem. Well, well, but 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 aren't we talking apples and oranges here? Are we talking about affordable assisted living units? Or are we just talking about affordable units? In other words, no, 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 no. Um, the milk it, was affordable assisted living. That's what I'm talking. Right, about. right, right. Yeah, but that's not what's necessarily proposed here, unless unless I mean, that's not what I've seen in any of this this element. Is that, um, and I might be mistaken, but. I, I thought it was just the below market senior rentals with no assistance element associated with that. <clears throat> and that's why it seems to me the mixing does somewhat create a problem because, you know, uh, assisted living generally has very controlled entrance and exit requirements. Um, and that's my dog, sorry. <laughs> uh, and so is, is what the city's saying is no, we want those nine units, but we want those nine affordable assisted living units. I, I guess I'm looking for clarity here. Or, or is the city saying, no, you can put nine below market, regular senior affordable housing with no services coming from the service provider? Because it seems to me something's not adding up here. Yeah, I, you know, my understanding is what the city wants is to have the units dispersed 
and so that the units in the assisted living project would be assisted living units. Right, and, and then, yeah, it, it sounds like that gets complicated though, doesn't it? Because now you're going to yeah. require, <clears throat> so I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand the city's position on, on why they want to make things more complicated for dispersion, when I can definitely see the applicant's point of an assisted living facility, which again, has very controlled elements associated with, with all, all parts of assisted living. So I guess I'm just, it's not I, clear I, to me. I think, I think the issue again is the issue, is it a physical preclusion or an, or, you know, or an economic and policy and cost preclusion? That's right, but, but aren't we still talking about two different things? We're talking about affordable senior housing, period, versus affordable assisted living. Those are two different things. And so dispersion among two different things, to me, <laughs> seems like it's, it's, it's two different animals. And so you are kind of um, insisting on something that I'm not quite, I'm, I, I'm not completely sold that um, it would be something that would, would um, would, is, is, is that the intent of the city, I guess? It comes down to, does the city not only want affordable senior housing, but the city wants nine units because of dispersion into the assisted living element and therefore having, um, uh, creating two different elements of, of senior housing as opposed to of, yeah. senior, senior, below market senior housing. I mean, my understanding was that, you know, the city wanted this, the, to meet the dispersion requirement, the city wanted, you know, the two types, basically, the, you know, assisted living in the, in building one, because they're, they're correct. It doesn't make sense to have non-assisted living in building one, and then, you know, non-assisted, but, you know, it's up to the commission to decide if, if, you know, as you say, you don't believe that the, you know, that these are two different types of housing. And so it's not really appropriate to require that they be met, you know, that, this, that the city make this right. requirement. Right. You, you're, I assume it gets free to, you're free to disagree. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm, it seems to me it gets complicated because now in terms of figuring out what that, we'll call it um, affordable assisted living, um, those nine units as previously discussed, um, you know, what, what actually do they pay? Is it just a rent element that's decremented and then all of the services are on top of that at the market rate or are we talking about discounts on the services as well? Um, so just, I, I, I don't know any of that it, right now. And so it, I don't feel in any position to make a decision either way because it's, it's, it's very muddy. It's, it's, it's definitely more complicated. Uh, Commissioner Fung? Thanks. Maybe just to follow up on that on that question, then I'm curious um, uh, to uh, Ms. Krauts, if if the applicant were to give were to offer nine units in Building One, which were not assisted living, is that acceptable or not? I'm not quite sure what the staff's position is. I think is. that's a, thing, I think, that's a, bit of a, think, a bit more directed version of. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nakashi's question. <laughs> a lot I mean, of convolution yeah, here. Yeah, I. Well, the, I mean, that's the question, right? If if it was sufficient to meet the requirement with yeah. nine units that were yeah. non. Yes, uh, that would be living, okay. Yeah. That would be okay. It should yeah. be okay. It should be. Okay. Yeah. Right, but but you would have to levy the requirements of, of controlled entrance and exit, signing in, signing out. Right, because that, that's the whole nature of assisted living. Yeah. You're, you're really yeah. keeping track of, of, of your tenants versus affordable senior housing, your you're independent living, essentially. It's a light, um, I mean, I, as Mr. Uh, Tersini said, it's a licensed facility. They're subject to pretty strict state standards, so. Exactly, and that's- I Correct, that's, it, 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 sorry, Commissioner, if I could just point out one thing, if I understood your correct uh, question, um, the state would not allow you to license a building and not license nine units within the building that were not being provided with assisted living services. So you, it, it right. would just be an impossibility to be able to create a license in that form. Right. You so wouldn't be able to that license. To answer your question. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. This license applies to everybody except for these nine units that are dispersed is not a, not possible. 
Correct. And we've asked, you, you can't do it. So. Well, and I would just comment, it, that would appear to be a restriction, which is not purely financial. Agreed. Well, on the one hand, <laughs> Um, I, I would like if, if someone could explain how someone would uh, qualify for affordable assisted living, um, what kind of health care coverage would they be receiving um, in order to meet that? Anyone? I mean, is that, is, is, I guess it comes back, is that a category of affordable senior housing? I don't know. I would think so, that we will have seniors in the community that need affordable. Yeah, but I would think so versus, I mean, I think we need a, it seems like we need some, some element of legal interpretation of, of is that a category uh, of If I may, housing. I believe under current state and local law, there is no such category. In your affordable housing fee, you know, your whole program, which requires affordable contributions, either building units or paying a fee, is based upon a nexus study that determined that building residential units creates a need for affordable housing units. You don't have a similar program for meals and, and taking care of people who need assistance and so on. Maybe you could, I've never heard of one actually, and maybe that's the next step that will end up there someday, but that's not doable under your affordable housing fee and the affordability requirements in state and law and in your code as well are all set up in terms of percentages of housing costs. You know, someone makes $100,000, 50% of that is very is low income and then or very low income and then 30% of that is rent. I mean it's that kind of calculation that you have in your code and everybody has and none of it relates to all these other services that are bundled together in an RCFE like building one. Yeah, it's actually not correct that your that your uh, requirements are. I mean, you did do a nexus study; it was great, but actually, under a case that Mr. Faber won at the California Supreme Court, they decided that no nexus study is required to uh, impose uh, inclusionary requirements to impose BMR requirements. So the nexus study is, is irrelevant in terms of the is irrelevant in terms of the. Uh, the 15% requirement. Um, as I said, the way that the project in Millbrae uh, made it affordable was that they basically calculated which part of the bundled costs were for rent and set those at the state lim at, you know, at the state and federal limits. So we are able to request affordable assisted living be in building one? Yes. We, we don't think so. If you wish. <laughs> <laughs> Madam, Madam Chair, can I, can I address the, the commission as far as why we're here tonight? Um, no, I'm sorry. We continue on with the commission's questions regarding this item, and then we open it up to the public hearing. Fair enough. So when the, when a commissioner is ready to understand why we're here, I'm- Excuse I'm me, ready thank to you. Ask. We yeah. move on to the commission questions. Um, I have a quick question, and this is this is just back to I, I do want to talk to the applicant. It's like, can I address the applicant? Sure. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. I, I do have a question, and it's really about. I know I'm the one who brought up the public health requirements uh, that were coming for COVID-19, and, and I'm glad that you guys took care of that uh, because I was worried about that, given that density is becoming a problem for a lot of these facilities. Uh, the related question is, and it's going to hit you guys as well, and, and this is only because, and it's not like I have any special inside knowledge, it's just because I've been watching how construction has been working for these buildings. Um, you may have different HVAC and ventilation requirements as well. Um, so I just wanted to make sure, I just wanted to ask the team if you guys had factored that in, especially the, uh, the architect on the side, because the uh, HEPA filtration that's going to be required for these type of units, especially given what you're doing for long-term memory care, um, it's going to be a little bit different. So just making sure that you guys have left enough room and, uh, for, for those vents and the units. Commissioner, I can address that as well. Part of the review that took place, extensive review that took place by the Atria team. And that was in addition to the work that was done at, prior to the uh, our first hearing was to address these very issues with my design team, which is C2K Architecture in Portland, Oregon. 
KT Urban has never built an assisted living project. And that's why we have now joined forces with Atria and related to build this project out. And through that, I was made aware that the nine units that I had asked the architects to put into building number one was an error. So I'm, we're addressing an error that I made given the facts of what the Atria product is and what they need in order for it to be a functioning licensed facility. And in addition to that, the interface that I've had with Related who has a joint venture, current joint venture relationship with Atria. So KT Urban is going to get the opportunity to join them as a joint venture partner in our Westport project, not on any other projects that they're involved with, just in our Westport project. So that's where the education has come. That's why we've had to come back to you to explain exactly why we're making the changes. And as we're making the changes, we address uh, the prior commissioner's comments with respect to the adequate space requirements for the facility, including the advent of the, or the, the addressing the new COVID uh, requirements that are in place. No, oh, thank you. And, and related and typically does build high-end facilities. And so I assume that the amenities in there will be the same. Is that correct? That is correct, Vice Chair. And, and I, I just say, I think we're continuing to investigate all types of additional um, you know, construction related adjustments that can be made and the te technological advances in terms of all, all types of sanitation. So we're looking into UV light technology, for example, um, and other HVAC systems that might be helpful um, sort of into the future for this community. So that's a process that started, is ongoing, and will continue for quite some time. Just a piece of advice. Look at what the dental offices are doing. They are probably furthest ahead of everyone at this moment. So. That's great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Are there further questions from the commissioners? Okay, I do have one question and that is, uh, you were able to have 83 uh, density bonus units. I was wondering why only 30 were chosen. Is, would anyone yeah. from applicants yeah. like to address yeah. that? Madam Chair, I can address that uh, question. Uh, what we are working with is a um, defined uh, number of units uh, for atria. And that's where we actually increase the yield. The density bonus allows us, we were originally looking at five density bonus units in our first application. When we uh, engage with related and atria, their requirement was to increase the number of units in building number one. When we did that, we needed to match our, and, and agreed to match our affordability requirement. So that raised the affordability requirement Actually, by eight, we rounded it up to nine unit more of affordable units. And that's where, in, in keeping our mix of row homes and townhomes the same. So we have a, we do have a real diverse project in having for sale units in the row homes and the townhomes. Affordable or the very low and low and the assisted living with the memory care. So it's a, it's a very unique uh, development in that it has the different product types for the residential, but that's, that's where it was. Could we go up higher? We could, but when you do that, you, you start to uh, create an imbalance of the, the unit mix that we just talked about. And then you drive again, parking requirements potentially go up and which requires more below grade parking which increases the cost. So it's, it's, a, it's a real balancing act of, of the project. There are right now to date on the affordable below and very low units, there is a, a, a very large gap of financing irrespective if we were just to donate the land to the affordable builder, whether or not it's related or, or another affordable builder there's a financial gap that goes far beyond that. That's where we will be working together to bridge that gap with state and local funding and other 
funding sources to get that back down. So what, what it does create for us is a more marketable product to attract the financing because we are now above the 37 units that we had before, which is really at the cusp of, is that really a sizable enough project to, to accommodate that? And that's why we're very fortunate to be able to add those units, nine, now we're going out to the market with the, a, uh, a, a number of units that I think is going to attract the capital. All right, thank you. Are there any further questions from the commissioners before I open it up for uh, the public hearing? Okay, seeing no further questions, uh, I have Jennifer Griffin has her hand up. Get the timer started. And she will have three minutes. And I have another hand up also. Okay, so Jennifer Griffin. Jennifer, are you there? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, welcome Jennifer. Okay. Yes, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Griffin. I have gone past this site since I was a child. My mother, my grandmother lived in Cupertino. My parents used to drive us past this site from the time I was three, four, five, six to grand, we were coming back from grandmother's house. Um, there, I, I will say that I am very, very lucky to have seen the original oak trees that were on the site. They are one of my fondest memories. There were two large um, oak, ancient oak groves that were there. I believe that they were probably used at various times by people who had apricot orchards and set up the tables under them to cut the apricots. My parents cut apricots in Mountain View and Los Altos when they were children and they had us cut them too. So I am very, very glad that I have this memory of this property. Um, I am not very pleased about the attempts to remove the oak trees that are on the property. So I went around the property today to refresh my memory because in 20, I believe it's 2010, the city council spent two to three meetings going tree by tree on that property to make sure that that there were oaks that were replaced as mitigation for some oaks that had to be taken down. I would like to see these records pulled back up again because I believe that we are sliding the work of a previous city council. Those trees were planted um, as they requested as mediation for several of the oaks that had to come down. The oak tree that is next to the jewelry store that is um, uh, fronting on Stevens Creek Boulevard. At the time I was a teen, the bus stop was there. I used to sit on that, either going to Deanza or going down to Balco. And there were very large oak trees there. That oak that is there is probably close to 175 years old. I cannot condone anyone taking that tree down. Um, that is part of the history of of Cupertino, the history of the site. There was another large oak grove. Uh, there are several other oak trees on the property. I sent a very detailed letter to the city council and planning commission this morning with the oaks on site. There are probably 20 oak trees, 10 years old that were planted on the east side of the property as, as west side as mitigation for some that were taken down. Um, we need to honor and remember what the previous city council did. That's what we did back then. Please we up, Jennifer. About our trees. We went through them. And I'm sorry, that building at Mary and Stevens Creek Boulevard is an atrocity. It is too tall. I don't want that in my city. Um, right. I don't Thank care you, what Jennifer. Scott Wiener thinks in Sacramento, but they can't cut our trees down. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Connie Cunningham. Connie, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Welcome, Connie. I'm starting the timer now. Okay. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, and Commissioners, and uh, all the people on the line this evening. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Connie Cunningham. 
I've lived here for 33 years and I'm currently on the Housing Commission, but speaking for myself only. Uh, tonight, you can take a step forward to help residents of all incomes and abilities as envisioned in the housing element of the general plan. During this pandemic induced economic downturn, you can approve the Westport to Cupertino project. Cupertino can begin its new normal life post COVID with a housing project that will help ease our housing shortage. I support the Westport project. I can see myself living in one of these lovely new homes. I was pleased to see the plan that was approved by the housing commission. I mean, excuse me, the planning commission on May 12th, 267 housing units with senior housing, 48 below market rate homes and 27 memory care homes. All of these are critical needs in Cupertino with its growing population of older residents. <clears throat> I'm persuaded by tonight's discussion that the changes have been made to the project better serves our community than the previous plan. In line with that Housing Accountability Act, I consider myself a reasonable person. I think the changes are consistent with the dispersal requirement without having to put those BMR units in the same facility as the memory care units. This project will provide significant housing for 267 families or individuals with 48 below market rate homes in an area that has access to transportation, businesses, the senior center, schools, including De Anza College. A gateway project at this site was envisioned in our general plan. KT Urban recognizes the needs in our city and has carefully designed this project. I really urge you to approve this plan tonight. I very much look forward to the day when families and individuals move in to Westport Cupertino. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Connie. Next, we have Peggy Griffin. Peggy, are you there? Um, yes. Okay, um, welcome, Peggy. You have three minutes. Okay, I have a slide. I, she probably only has the older version. Okay, I'm gonna pause you. And uh, Madam Clerk, do you have a slide for, for Peggy? And where is... Okay, we're looking for a slide from Peggy Griffin. Do we have one available? Yes, let me work, working on bringing it up now. Okay. There it is, okay. Can you see it? Not yet. No. There we go. No? Why isn't this working? Huh. All right. Let's try this again. All right, there it is. Now you should be able to see it, yes? Oh, good. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right, you're, you're sorry ready. about that delay. I apologize. Okay, welcome, Peggy. Thank you. I'll need you to scroll in a little bit. Um, commissioners, staff, I would the comments. I like the project overall. Just wish buildings one and two were less dense. I like the variety of the housing options, the rentals, the for sales, and the income variety. I like the amenities were that the amenities were moved to the sixth floor so it didn't get mixed up with the commercial retail ground floor and that the towers were removed. I'm very concerned about the KT Urban's phasing. It feels like it would replicate the Main Street senior housing fiasco and I would not like to see that happen. Could you please scroll up a little bit? I'm asking the Planning Commission to require BMR disbursement throughout the project, or at least all but building one at the minimum. Require a waiver or concession for the BMR comparability. Clarify in writing in the conditions of approval that the 88 townhouses, row houses are for sale. Um, the exact location 
and size of the BMR units as part of the approval. Can you scroll up a little bit more, please? Um, that prior to certificate of occupancy also applies to temporary occupancy. That was a Main Street issue. That all commercial, retail, and restaurant services are accessible to all the public, not just seniors. In the attachment nine, project description, page five, paragraph four, last sentence, it implies that seniors from the public, but what about the ends? What about other people? And please clarify what exactly is the bike path through the complex? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peggy. And next we have Lisa Warren. I'm going to mute Peggy. And right. Okay, Lisa Warren. Hey. So Welcome I would like to, the, your time I, is okay. So I'd like to, um, I'm glad Peggy brought it up because it was one of the first thing on my list that there's nowhere in writing in black and white that I could find in project description or anywhere else that validates, confirms, promises, whatever you want to call it, that the townhouses and row houses will be for sale. And that is a must. I don't know how you could not have that in there. Um, we've had the issue before with 19800 where they were supposed to be for sale condos and then they turned into for rent condos so that's not okay we're not going to do that again um but if you don't even start with the language no one knows what's real it's been mentioned but i don't see it in writing so and to be consistent with the past i'm still not comfortable at all with the height or the setbacks of this project um we had the community survey in 2015 and I can tell you with the examples and the language, et cetera, et cetera, when people chose what building heights and setbacks and building planes they wanted, it was not based on waivers and concessions being able to blow them out of the water. If they knew that that was something that could happen, they would have said 25 feet instead of 45. It's just, it's, it's a game that's played by, I don't know, but it's not fair, correct, to communities that have to bear the brunt of these twists and turns when they're given their input and it's supposed to be respected and then it gets just screwed up. So please respect that whenever you can. And maybe it's time to change our general plan again and make those objective standards lower so that all this stuff doesn't mess it up. Anyway, I'm a little passionate about that in case you couldn't tell. Um, so let's see. Uh, I too would like more detail about the bike route. Um, it's been thrown out that it's there, but bike pad wanted needed more information. I think Commissioner Takahashi asked some questions. I don't know that it hasn't been more defined, but it didn't show up in that way in the presentation tonight. So I don't know what your decision is tonight will affect that. And it is an important thing to the community. Um, BMR, <laughs> it was brought up a bit. Well, let me back up a minute. The applicant's attorney, Mr. Faber, was equally insistent that two months ago, that project was great. Nothing wrong with it. The applicant himself, Mr. Tresini, has admitted to an error. Why was that error not brought up before this came to you the first time? And as I understand it, they wanted this new project to go straight to council and bypass you which would have been ludicrous. I need you to wrap up, Lisa. Okay, so I just, you know, you were a big bulldog, Mr. Faber, for the last project, and now you're doing it again, saying the last project wasn't gonna cut it. So it's just, and the whole suspicion of fake retail is very real. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Uh, <laughs> All right. Okay, I, we're, uh, Madam Clerk, did we receive any written communications? Yes, we have two, we have two emails. Okay, um, and those occurred during this presentation this evening, so you'll be reading those, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, you ready for the first one? Yes, please. Okay, it's from Umesh 
Chaprani, and I'm sorry if that pronunciation is incorrect. Um, he writes, listening to the request for approval from builders on property formerly known as the Oaks, <clears throat> excuse me, corner of Mary and Stevens Creek. I'm not confident of the data being presented. <laughs> Concerns I have, one, traffic. Data is clearly inaccurate. 267 new homes is going to lead to far more traffic than is being shown. Two, ramifications on schools is unclear. I understand that the primary purpose is senior housing for a subset of the units, but I do not believe we will see a demand for these units. And three, no commercial space. Suggestion, reduce the number of housing units and add commercial space to attract new companies to Cupertino. This is sorely missing and we need to place emphasis on this to bring more companies. This would alleviate the above concerns, still be lucrative for the builder and work to bring more business to Cupertino. Okay, that is that email. And the other one is over here. This email is from Rhonda Nunes. She says, good evening. Please consider our denial request regarding the Westport Cupertino development proposal. One, deny the heart of the city exception for retail frontage along Stevens Creek Boulevard across from De Anza College. Two, deny the density bonus and density bonus waivers for height, building plane, and below market rate housing. There were reasons why Cupertino City placed limits for height and density construction plans. By the way, there is already major congestion on 85, and we don't need to intensify our traffic issues. If you haven't seen it already, check out the corner of San Carlos and Sonol Street in San Jose as an example of the gross appearance of such buildings. I am available and will continue to monitor this project proposal. Best regard, Rhonda Nunes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Well, is that all of the uh, written communications you received? Yes, that's all we have. Okay. Um, next. Were there any questions that uh, that staff uh, felt that they needed to answer from any of the speakers? Okay. And are there any further questions from the commissioners? No further questions from the commissioners. Okay, so we are allowed now an applicant response time. Um, and since we had no questions, there's nothing to do there. We're moving on to, we have closed the public hearing and we are on to deliberations. Would anyone care to make a motion? Do you want to discuss this a bit before we make a motion or that's the way? Can't discuss until we make a motion, I believe. Sure. Is, that, is that proper? We can do that. We can do it before? Okay. Uh, Someone wants to have some input. Yeah. <laughs> I wish translation, I translation <laughs> please. <laughs> it looks as though we have some issue with the, the finances and I, I, I am kind of questioning why we, why staff, uh, because it kind of seems as though if they're saying that there was, it was a concession, that there needed to be more information, some financial information about that concession. So my question is around whether or not the application was really complete. If um, you're contending that uh, more information is, is, would be needed and that we could actually have a denial based on that lack of information. 
Sure, I, I, I can answer this, and then um, you know, Barbara, you can step in. What do you think I was lacking? Um, again, the, we deemed the application complete back in July of 2019, pretty much a year ago, actually. Um, and we felt that we had enough information. And of course, it was a slightly different project back then. Um, coming into this point, it's not, it's not a new application. It's just a, a modification of the existing application. So there's no, there's no complete, incomplete, um, say, a letter to send out to the applicant. You know, we did send out some memos saying, you know, if you want to have this change, we see this as um, an incentive or concession rather than a waiver. And speaking specifically of the of the dispersal um, change from um, the nine units from building one to building two. Um, that being said, you know, again, there's no complete or incomplete process at, at this point, as it's not a new application. So in a sense, we, you know, we're, we, we're, we're giving the planning commission options to recommend, you know, approval with, the, with these added conditions or denial because of how we feel, you know, it's, it's, it's up to the play. The, the planning commission can certainly disagree with staff's um, take on the, on, on the modification as well. So it's, it's, it's up to you. It's, it's really up to the commission's purview as to whether, how they see it as, to, to recommend to the city council. I mean, I think that the application was, you know, the applicant was invited to apply for a concession, didn't want to, instead applied for a, for a waiver. The application was complete. Uh, there was a justification provided. So in that sense, um, you know, it, the issue about whether the application is complete is different from the issue about whether they provided adequate justification. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> just, just to understand, we have two parts of that of the financial issue. We've got uh, the financial issue of whether or not there's dispersal in Building One, and the financial issue, a concession issue about whether or not uh, their their BMRs are in the row houses and townhouses. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. I, um, Commissioner Takahashi. Uh, yeah, I guess I, 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 that's not what I was thinking. Um, so I just want clarity on that. I thought really the heart of the issue was whether or not um, the dispersion was in, you know, given the, the row house, and, and I agree with the, um, some of the public comments, we do need some level of memorialization that the, the row houses will be for sale units. Um, so, so, but given that, and we're, we were talking about BMR senior housing, that the, the main tenets of the disagreement are whether or not dispersion requirements applied such that um, nine units needed to be in building one, even though building one is purely an assisted living run by Atria, um, and therefore potentially creating problems with regard to um, licensing. Um, so I guess I, I, I wasn't thinking that now we're also talking about dispersion into the row houses, giving it's a different type of unit. It's a for sale unit versus a for rent unit. Um, I think we have so two issues. I think we have two issues, but I want to get clarification from Barbara if those are if those are adequate in terms of the, the, the way they're being described that we have to think through. So because it's and is it within our purview to be able to make that decision? It seems so when I read the municipal code, but I'm not sure based on some of these other conversations. Well, the, <clears throat> so, the, uh, so what was recommended for approval before and is now and is still being recommended for approval is to allow the units, is to grant a waiver so the units do not have to be included in the row houses. So that is a decision for the commission to decide whether you agree or disagree with that reasoning. One of the one of the findings for the development permit is that that waiver is justified because uh, because the applicant intended to build senior affordable housing. The other issue is the staff recommendation that the nine of the units uh, still be located in building one uh, in the right. in the living, and I right. think the so somewhat issues 
but. Okay. So, but given, given we approved previously the waiver, if you will, um, we're just going to reopen that. Is that, is that the thinking of the commission in terms of the, the row house inclusion in BMR versus, um, sticking to the, the rental units? Well, it seems as though the, the issue of the finances, um, is really what has us here discussing tonight. So you've got the financial issue, which then puts us into a concession rather than the waiver. So if we agree that this is a financial issue and that the, the reasoning behind, you know, having all those BMR units in building two was for financial reasons, as is stated in the, the staff report is what we're being told. And then now we also have an additional reason, um, a financial reason um, for the row houses and townhouses to not have any uh, BMR um, units there. Then we've got, uh, you know, where we have recommended denial of the project, page 27 of the staff report, you now have a secondary issue um, with the row houses and townhouses um, not being addressed um, there. And Why is that an issue now versus the last meeting, I guess? We concluded in the last meeting that wasn't an issue, and now we're saying it is an issue. We're somewhat being inconsistent, it seems to me. Uh, I would and I would add to that as well that there, is a, you know, the, there was the um, consulting architect that also had weighed in on that in the prior uh, hearing. We're being advised differently. Well, I, I mean, I think no, in, the not actually. Hearing, <laughs> in the prior hearing, you did grant the waiver. You did grant the waiver, so right. they didn't need to disperse the units to the row houses. Right. Right. However, so that, but it was listed as, I believe, one of your actions you took. Yeah. However, now, now we're being told those units are all going into building two. Right. And the reason they need to be there is financial and that 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 issue wasn't it that didn't exist before so I, I don't see how we can you know pretend away that this is a concession um when when the the definition of concession has been explained as you know this it's when you get into the financial issue you're it's now a concession it's not a waiver and i i don't really understand why we haven't just simply been handed some financial information about you know why this is necessary to look at i, I you know, and that, that, that gets into my question about why isn't this considered, you know, incomplete when it seems like all we need are some financial documents. I don't understand why that is, you know, such such a complicated um, hurdle to to get over. Um, maybe someone can explain that. I mean, yeah, I you may agree. If the app applicant, why you may want to ask the applicant why they didn't apply for a concession. Uh, would someone from the applicants team like to answer that? Uh, yeah, I can answer that. This is this is Andy Faber, and the, re the reason is that um, your own ordinance makes it uh, uh, sets it up as a potential great pitfall to ask for financial concessions because I'm reading from the ordinance here. Uh, the state law says you can only ask for reasonable documentation to show that there are actual and identifiable savings. That's all you're allowed under state law. Your ordinance requires a written statement. Um, that shows that the incentive or concession contributes significantly to the economic feasibility of the affordable housing. That's the standard. And it requires a financial report, which might be in the form of a pro forma. It's a long paragraph. I won't read the whole thing. But it will include capital costs, operating expenses, return on investment, loan to value ratio, debt coverage, et cetera, et cetera. And it, that's one thing. It requires an appraisal report indicating the value of the density bonus and the incentives or concessions. It requires a use of funds statement showing the financial gaps for the housing uh, development with the affordable housing units. And then it requires a deposit to cover the city having all of that peer reviewed with outside consultants. So the fact is all of, none of that can actually be required under state law, but we don't, we didn't want to spend a huge amount of time arguing about that. And with the fact that there is known opposition to this project, every one of the things I just talked about could be argued about. All of those things are much further than you're saying, as you are mentioning now from the bench here, from the AS, uh, that just it's a financial issue, so we'll grant a concession. 
if you want to call it a concession or incentive that's fine but if we get caught up having to submit all of these documents those could be challenged endlessly and opponents of the project could say no we need to study them we need a different peer review of this uh, I, I believe as i've said that all of this is not consistent with state law it used to, state law used to require more detail than it does now and this is probably a bit out of date but the fact is it's all in your code and we felt that we did not need to use an incentive or concession we thought the waivers were adequate and that if we did ask for an incentive or concession we would get tied up with these documents for a very long time potentially and they would create a lot of points where we could be challenged so that was our thinking in saying we don't want to call it an incentive or concession all right i was wondering if thank you andrew I was wondering if uh, someone from staff would like to summarize the reasoning we were just given and um, let us know what your opinion is about it. Well, everything that, and I'll start off and then Barbara can, can um, fill in, you know, all the reasons that Mr. Faber had given, we're not, <laughs> we're not giving the staff as the reason why they didn't give the center of concession or go that route, you know, it was, you know, I, I think it was limited to, we didn't want to expose our profit margins or, or we want to explode we want to make make public our, our performance which is fine and you know if, if 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 it's the case that maybe portions of our density bonus ordinance at least our application requirements maybe aren't in sync with state law and barbara again correct me if i'm wrong you know, we would defer to state law in, in, the, in any event and, and and there could have been a way to to adjust those application requirements not necessarily to require a performer wherever else but Unfortunately, it was it wasn't um, the conversation ever led to that. Yeah, I uh, you know I'm not familiar with the conversations with the applicant, but I uh, what John told you is essentially correct. So the state law was changed a few years ago, uh, basically because developers objected to uh, providing pro formas to justify an incentive or concession. And it now says you can't require a study, but you can require reasonable documentation, you know, which leaves a fair amount of work, uh, of room for interpretation, right? But, but, you know, knowing that the history was that you couldn't require a pro forma, Mr. Faber is probably correct that the, you know, all the detailed requirements are probably too much. Um, and so the extent of the justification that's required really depends on what's being asked for. Here, um, here, you know, as we understand it, basically there's a, a problem with locating the affordable units in the assisted living facility for various uh, reasons that were explained to the commission. And in addition, the pro, you know the units are will be eligible for tax credits if they're in one building, which clearly would save the applicant a great deal of money. So, so you know, so some documentation of that might might have been adequate. You know, we you know without without looking at what was presented, um, it seems it would be possible to justify this particular concession. Um, which is directly related to costs. Some concessions people ask for are not very related to cost, but this one is. Um, it should be possible to put something together. <clears throat> Thank you, um, and I understand that. So, uh, so for reasonable documentation, we actually have none with with which to um, make a decision on. Um, um, may I ask another question, Chair? Yes. And, and this is really to Barbara, and, and I'm just trying to understand how this fits because I, I've spent a couple hours looking at our BMR standard codes. So when I look at CMC 1956060.G2, reduction in design standards require prior council approval. Um, I just want to know how is that applicable in this situation? So. You know, I haven't looked at that and I can't really, I okay. can't really. Just trying to understand like where what yeah. the where the process is and what the first principles are here. Yeah. Okay. Um, Vice Chair Wong, are you are you looking at in terms of the the square footage, uh, comparable square footage, or just that the materials are the same? Um, which aspect to uh, the BMR uh, standards are you interested in? 
It was just the reduction in design standards and depending what you have to do. I just want to know how they apply or where they do apply, if we have a reduction in standards or not. So okay. I don't think so. I'm just trying to figure out. I've been going through all the different standards for some time. Okay. I mean, with different uh, CMCs as, as they apply to BMR. Okay, so with BMR, you need to also look at um, resolution 15-037, which is the BMR manual. And yep. in it, it, right, okay, so when you get into that, then they talk about having the same number of bedrooms, um, the same number of um, uh, similar square footage, um, and then having similar materials in, in each type of unit so that you don't have, you know, vastly different um, design types um and and i'm sure that uh john can you know pull that up and we, we can look at that if it's if it's something helpful that's why i brought up the question about the you know almost 200 square feet difference between the um the two bedroom units um because in, in in my house that's two bedrooms um so it would actually turn that two bedroom into a into a four bedroom that, that was affordable um so, uh, looking at, you know, little 10 by 10 bedrooms. Um, so, are there any uh, further comments from the commissioners? Any further questions? Or would Please. someone like to make a motion? We could do the simple ones. If you want to do them part wise. Um, I'm concerned yeah. about dividing up the, uh, I'm concerned about dividing up the approvals. Um, on page 27, we have a recommend denial of the project. And then alternatively, we have recommend certification of the EIR and conditional approval of the project. Um, However, when I look at recommended denial of the project, it's only referring to the one um, financial um, issue, uh, which makes it a concession. And uh, that is, again, not having those uh, affordable units in building one. And, and then the second part is not having the row houses uh, have a, an affordable um, option there as well and that would be a moderate rate and uh, you know listening to one of the, the housing commissioners who came you know representing herself uh, we're trying to provide housing all types of housing and we have an opportunity where you can have the affordable housing in the assisted living building and have affordable housing in the multi um, bedroom row houses and townhouses so that you can have uh, people who qualify for below market rate um, families, which is one of the uh, major complaints of the Valco project is that you wouldn't be able to fit um, families in those little tiny studio and one bedroom units that are in that project. But here you have an opportunity where you can have below market rate uh, for for a family, for a, for a large family. And uh, so it seems a bit inconsistent with what we're trying to do in the general plan, trying to accommodate all kinds of housing for the community. So I, I just, I guess in comment to that, I would say that, you know, you would do so in trading, in doing so you would be trading off senior BMR units, you know, that are being, that are being offered up here. So that's something, you know, uh, you know, as, as we saw the presentation be prior to the, um, you know, prior to the hearing, to this hearing, that actually, uh, because of the trend, the demographic trends that we anticipate, um, weighing toward senior housing is probably a smart move rather than, rather than not, I think. There's an opportunity here, you know, we yield more numbers, more, a, a number above the city requirement because there is an opportunity for things like, you know, for uh, low income housing tax credits to be applied if the, if we're building the, the appropriate form. So I, I, you know, I hear that. I think that there'll be a lot of opportunity to try to have that discussion and address that in projects that come before in the future. Um, 
I don't know. I, maybe, I, I, so I, I think everybody probably has comments lined up on things that they want to talk about. So maybe I'll talk about a few of those here. You know, I, I think uh, Commissioner Takahashi touched on this. This was my main reflection on this coming into this hearing was that uh, what exactly, what benefit are we expecting to get here if we were to impose additional uh, requirements on this project? Uh, do we benefit the city greatly? Do those nine, do, you know, do those nine units greatly benefit the city relative to the, you know, potentially not building this at all? And, you know, I, I just don't see that, that being the case. Uh, you know, in many respects here, um, this has been a challenging project, you know, over time. And, uh, you know, I think that we've seen, you know, of course, there are a number of presentations, a number of proposals, you know, uh, early on, you know, ones that would have required a GPA, which were uh, quite a bit larger. This project is not that large. This is a project where, you know, there was an opportunity to take more units. I actually have a bit of a problem. I think you touched on that as well, uh, uh, Chair Moore. Uh, that if we're going to use the density bonus, that perhaps we should have used it more aggressively to deliver more units, um, you know, to deliver more units to the housing supply. But uh, there are lots of good reasons, you know, particularly things, you know, the, the, the kinds of problems that drive a lot of these projects like, like parking requirements, make it just impossible to, um, you know, to fully, you know, utilize it, you know, um, build the number of units that you could uh, under under our laws. So I, I guess, I, you know, I, I look at this and I really say, hey, you know, there's there's benefits to be had from, from um, there's, cl there's clearly a benefit from the project that we approved in, in May. There are clearly benefits that come, I think a number of improvements in this project. If people were concerned about height, I think that that's actually, uh, that's actually better. Uh, you know, having parking, having parking that exceeds the requirements, having uh, open space that exceeds the requirements. There are a number of, diff of things here that I think make this project a valuable one to move forward. So I'd rather see it be less um, constrained. Um, I think there are two points of context that I thought were really important on this. One is an economic point of context. You know, we're in the, you know, in the COVID times, um, with the economy flipped upside down, it's hard to say whether that is preferential or, you know, whether that helps or hurts the ability to produce housing. Um, you know, a lot of the tall, a lot of the tall buildings in downtown San Jose were built during the last recession. Um, so there's no easy way to tell, but again, if there's an opportunity for this to move forward, and I think, I think that the applicant has been very serious about that, that we ought to think seriously about that and try to understand, you know, uh, do we gain, gain great benefit by trying to do something where, you know, uh, you know, if we're insistent upon the distribution of these, of the, of that number of units, uh, of BMR units into building one, if that caused it to not be possible for it to be a assisted care facility, then, you know, that, that, that doesn't seem like a hard choice to me. Uh, the other, the other, um, context that I think is important to look at, it really is around housing need. Um, you know, there is a short-term housing need. I think that I would hope that we, we can approve this project and that it would be built before we get to the next arena cycle. Um, uh, if so, then the addition of the 267 units, plus or minus the 27, however you want to count it, um, is a great improvement over the really, really, really horrible uh, housing production that we've had, you know, unfortunately in a great economy, we've had pretty horrible, uh, pretty horrible housing production numbers. So I think that it's a plus in the short term. And I think it's also, you know, as you look at the high arena numbers that we're likely to see in the next housing element, that this is a good use of this land in terms of producing, producing units here now, rather than trying to reduce the density and, um, and, and come up short. Um, so, so I guess, uh, you know, I would have liked to have seen, I would have liked to have seen more units um, come in, maybe, maybe something different with the row houses, but I think that these were concessions that were made to the community to try to get the project through, uh, you know, to, to improve the project's acceptance. So, you know, I hope that, I hope people will recognize that. Um, anyway, so it, kind of in short, you know, I really believe this, that moving forward with Westport, 
is a clear benefit to the city. Uh, we agreed to it in May. Uh, you know, I hope we can agree to something tonight. Uh, I'm a little disappointed that this wasn't something that uh, was arranged, you know, that could have been handled by staff uh, and the city manager, uh, rather than coming back for this hearing. Um, as, as more information has come out in the past few days, I guess I understand to a little bit greater extent why there's a, the problems with the, um, you know, with the, uh, with the relocation of the units. Uh, I, I have to say, I didn't find the city's argument with regard to dispersal particularly compelling relative to the ones that have to do with things like the difference between, um, you know, between, uh, uh, you know, um, as assisted living and independent living. Um, anyway, so I, I, I guess I just want to say I, I, I oppose, I actually oppose uh, adding additional restrictions. I'd rather that we just approved it as the project came in. Uh, that was one of the options that, that was laid out in the later report. Um, but I'm support, in support of this project. So if we're going to craft something that, you know, that, you know, that, that may put some additional conditions on, you know, so be it. Um, that's all I have to say. Um, commissioners who would like to speak next? Uh, I'll go next. Um, Thank you, Chair Mo. Yes. Um, so, yes, um, uh, first of all, um, I like to echo a lot of stuff which uh, Commissioner Fang said. Um, I think this project uh, serves the community well. Uh, it has a good mix of a lot of things a community needs. Um, it doesn't have offices, which a lot of our community members didn't want to have in this building. Um, in the redesign, uh, I like the fact that the height of building one has come down. Um, I think that was one of the biggest things which we looked at in the previous thing. So, you know, um, every few feet comes. Um, regarding the comment about density and parking with Commissioner Fang said, um, I think uh, in our community, especially, which is not served by major, major transit lines, it's really, really important to have adequate parking. Um, over the past decade, actually, private car ownership had sort of tapered off in big cities because the younger people were taking Uber and other shared ride things. But um, I've personally known so many people who never thought they would buy a car are now buying a car because of the, the pandemic. So uh, the, the number of cars per home is now likely going to trend up, and the trend is going to probably reverse if that was the Yes, it was earlier. And uh, given the fact that uh, there is quite a bit of density there, we need to have enough parking within the complex to make sure nothing spills over. And because we have senior living, we expect their relatives, their children, their grandchildren to come and visit them. We need to have adequate guest parking also. So uh, I'm glad that uh, there is a little bit of over provisioning on the parking front uh, in this project. Um, Another aspect which I wanted to talk about was that because it's an assisted living facility which will have its own staff, um, I want to make sure that the parking estimates actually account for the parking needed for the staff in the facility. Because I mean, uh, I don't know the exact ratios, but there can be a pretty substantial number of people coming in to serve the elderly there. And uh, so that's a question for the city staff. Do we account for that in the parking requirement? Uh, yes, and it should be within the staff report. I apologize. I'll have it off the top of my fingertips. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to confirm that, sir. So, yeah, uh, yes, yes, it was. Yes, it was. Okay. So, um, I would say that um, uh, the fact that we are slightly over provisioned for parking is a good thing and it actually aligns with what our city needs. Um, I personally am at a bit of a loss about the distribution of PMR housing thing. Uh, I'm going to defer to what our city attorneys and our city staff uh, feels about it. Uh, but I do want us as, 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 uh, as a commission to make sure that we try to follow both the letter and the spirit of the law in this case and do the right thing. 
That's all. Thank you, Commissioner Saxena. Um, Commissioner Takahashi, would you like to s say something? Something. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, this one has um, got complicated on us um, and it seems to me we're making, trying to do everything we can to make it as complicated as possible as opposed to the striving for simplicity. Um, I think the general overall goals of the project with regard to um, providing senior housing um, and then um, turning that into um, affordable senior housing, assisted living, and um, more uh, and the row housing. I think um, there was a, there was a lot of agreement that um, that was a good thing for the community and and the retail component being of um, another benefit. Um, and the fact that there's no office, I think there were a lot of people that were that were supporting that. Um, just as a side, I think um, office demand will never be the same <laughs> after this pandemic. So it'll be interesting to see how that market um, fares in the future in terms of um, office space um, because of um, telecommuting. Um, anyway, um, so I guess you know, the, to deny this project on the on on a nine unit movement, especially given the circumstances associated with the fact that. Um, it's, it's nine units that were mixed into um, a assisted living um, facility that has uh, memory care and um, great gradients of assistance um, seemed, um, does not seem like a wise um, decision from the standpoint of um, denying this project. Um, the it, it's, I guess it is unfortunate that, that it seems the city has somewhat onerous um, requirements for um, granting a concession versus a waiver. That seems like that needs to be revisited given changes in state laws. Um, however, it, it seems like some level of agreement could have been reached between the city and um, KT Urban. Um, so um, that's unfortunate that that wasn't done, um, putting us where we're at now. Um, but it's still, I think, uh, a, a, a significant need for the city to be providing this, this gap in senior housing, um, as well as the assisted living element. Um, I think both those are, are seen as, as, as um, needs that, that we as a commission need to, to figure out how to make um, happen and how to fill that, that need for the community. So that's all I got to say. Thank you, Commissioner Takahashi. Vice Chair Wong. Yeah, I'm not going to rehash what a lot of folks have said, I, I think. But the main point is, uh, you know, I, I like this project. Um, I like the fact that it's got, you know, the mixed use. I think it's important. Uh, we do see trends. I don't know how many seniors are actually going to stay. Everybody loves to make that argument that, you know, seniors in the area are going to need to switch to different homes. I think they're quite happy in their own homes. And in fact, most of them are actually leaving the state and going somewhere else where it's cheaper and they don't have state income taxes to pay. So, so I, that, that's probably, of all the presentations, I thought that was probably the silliest to me because that's not necessarily happening. People are actually leaving the state. Uh, but as far as the housing stock and creating the right housing stock and thinking about what we need for a tax base and getting some retail in there, um, I think we've got a good mix of things that are there. So I, I do like the project. I am supportive of the project. I think it's very important. Uh, what I am worried about is the consistent, um, I think perversion would be too strong of a word to say, but the consistent um, inconsistency in terms of applicability of our own laws when we go into decisions. It's as if almost everything we've done is an exception. And, and that, that's just bizarre. Like everything we do is an exception today, right? At the few laws where we have few powers that are in play, um, that are designed to protect residents, protect the city, um, we just seem to ignore them, right? Uh, they're given away. They're waivers or concessions or incentives. And, and, and it's just, it, you know, if, if I was a, a lawyer on the other side, if I was like a business person on the other side, I, I know, yeah, I can always cut a deal, right? And, and it's just something weird. And I, when I go back and study the history of why we have those laws in place and why we have regulations, and keep in mind, like before I took this job, I was a I was a free market capitalist, right? Now I understand why we have these regulations, 
right? I, I understand they're there to protect us. Now, in this case, we don't have a predatory developer that's really trying to pervert the rules, right? Um, but but there's something here that I quite, I'm still not sure of why certain things weren't put into place. I understand the legal ramifications. I understand it's going to take more time. I understand the financial models were a little bit different uh, as we started to understand what it would be to actually run a healthcare facility or long-term care facility versus if this was, you know, just BMR housing. So, so I understand those were in place and those were changing dynamics. I'm just still trying to understand like, you know, what missing part was, you know, that, that would have made the application kosher. I mean, that's really what it is. I mean, I, I, I just wish for one, someone would just say, and maybe we don't get to see those. Maybe we only see the exceptions on the planning commission, but where someone said, hey, yeah, we follow the rules. Here's where it is. Congratulations, rubber stamp. That's all your, right? I'm, I'm sure the applicant would love to see that too, right? So, so that, that's just kind of where I'm at at this. I support the project. Um, I just wish we would follow the rules in the application process. And, and I, I say that to staff as well. I know it's a hard job to make those calls. And, and they're trying to do that to keep as many of these projects in front of us, you know, to actually streamline the process. But, but that's, that's kind of what my thoughts are here. But we don't have a motion on the table, so I'm not sure what we're discussing either. So more, more parliamentary procedure. Um, true. Um, so when I'm looking at our potential options here, um, you know, first, uh, you know, I want to echo everything you've all said about the project. I, I, I'm excited about the assisted living option now. I'm excited about the memory care um, that we have BMR senior uh, units being offered. I, I, you know, especially on the west side of uh, Cupertino with uh, declining enrollment, it's exciting to see the, the housing for that, that can accommodate families who will potentially have students that will, that will be, uh, you know, attending those schools. Um, I wish, you know, because it is right next to Danza College, that something could be done to accommodate the students. And looking down, um, in, you know, in the future, this is going to be potentially, you know, when you're looking at the 85 corridor having some high quality transit. And if you're looking at having a uh, Stevens Creek Boulevard to Deeradon Station to the airport, um, you know, they're, they're looking at all sorts of different modes of uh, high quality transit uh, from a hyperloop to, and that's a lower speed hyperloop, um, to uh, monorail, to um, tunnels with autonomous vehicles, um, all, all different options. But this would be a huge hub for those uh, transit solutions in, in the future. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that this, this particular project would capitalize on that, um, that new reality for that location in the future. Um, when I look at uh, pages 27 and 28 um, of the staff report, I'm, I'm seeing the same kind of glaring issue regarding the concession, and I can't I can't square the circle. It's like we need to there they are needed to be a a concession with um, with having those units. Uh, you know, not be in building one. If you're gonna deny the project, you're denying it based on the fact that it's actually a concession. If you, if you want to approve the project, alternatively, if the planning commission determines that the project would be better with all the BMR units in building two, and there is sufficient information in the record to support a concession for the BMR unit dispersion requirement, we don't have any information in the record. We have, we have a sentence that says, uh, you know, they would get some extra funding if they do this. Um, just, you know, even even for the retail reduction you had at Valco, there were two, two, one or two pieces of paper, you know, and that was all that was required um, in order to, to get that concession. So, uh, you know, I would want, you know, city council to have information to make a decision on. And, you know, either way we go, you, you need to have some information to hand to them. So what, how are we making our decision without any finances? I don't understand. So either way you want to go, if you don't want to have it in building two, I feel as though we're sort of cornered, you know, without, without the documentation. I don't, I don't see how we can, you know, move forward without uh, heading into a denial. You know, somebody just explain the logic of how you can do that. And I, you know, I have to say good luck. Uh, 
Vice Chair? Uh, 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 just a process question. We've been going on since, I don't know, 6.30. Is it possible to take a bio break, please? Are we allowed to do that anymore? We haven't done these in these virtual meetings yet. But. <laughs> uh, um, Seth? I don't know process-wise. Are we allowed to or not? So if, are we allowed to take a five-minute break? Or? Absolutely. Do what you need to do. Thanks. Right. So, okay. Um, what's what is the process? Mike? Do we do we adjourn? Do we like uh, take a break and then come back, or do we or do we just individually take off? Sorry about that. I'm just. What, what language would you like? Uh, let, let let's have the uh, well. Let's just do. Uh, you muted yourself. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> you better. You might have glitched. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? So in a yep. typical in-person meeting, we would just call, uh, I believe we would call a break. Uh, we would, uh, you know, temporarily uh, suspend the meeting. And um, I don't know if uh, the tech folks can turn off the video or pause the video uh, temporarily and just call a five minute adjournment. Yeah. Okay, or, or alternatively, we can um, stop our own individual videos and, and then return. So we will be uh, returning it is uh, 9.56, I'm, I'm gonna give you four minutes. You have until 10 o'clock, all right, to return. <laughs> Thank you.
Who are we missing? At least no naked gun moments. <laughs> okay, so Commissioner Saxena needs to return if he is not. Oh, there we go. Great. Um, Madam Chair? Yes. If I could just add, uh, suggest something. It, it seems I heard and possibly not. Um, if possible, I didn't hear correctly. It seemed like a majority of the committee wished to allow all the affordable units possibly to be in building two. And one of the definitions of a uh, incentive that's contained in state law is, a, is, a, is an incentive or concession proposed by the city that would result in identifiable and actual cost reductions to provide for affordable rents. Now you know that if the build, if the units are all included in building two, they would all be eligible for uh, uh, tax credits, for federal tax credits, um, which would provide a subsidy that would enable, that would better enable, wouldn't make up all of the gap, uh, that would better, better enable the project to provide for affordable housing costs, if you wish to make that finding, I think the commission probably has sufficient information to know that without subsidies, um, no housing would be affordable to low income people in, in this, in this, <laughs> in Cupertino. Okay, so that, that, that making an assumption that we were all in agreement on that. No, I wasn't, not at all, but possibly a majority. <laughs> um. Well, actually, I'll just, I'd like to ask another. Uh, I'd like to ask another question. Uh, since we really all enjoyed our four-minute break, I'm curious uh, if, if because I, I felt there was also a majority of people who were um, interested in looking at who would entertain a motion for for an approval here. Uh, I'm curious about how much time staff would like to have. Uh, were we to recraft the resolution. Five or 10 minutes. Okay. I'm, I'm not looking at that because of the, the lack of the concession information. I'm still looking at, uh, I, I still see that we are, I feel that we're still cornered. Um, and I would rather this went to, to city council um, with the documentation, with the financials, um, and that we leave it in their hands and they make the decision. Um, because, you know, this, this does have political ramifications outside of the city for what we are, are approving and not approving. And right now we have, you know, upwards of 3,000 entitled units. Uh, we have, you know, 2,402 at Valco, including 1,201 below market rate um, units. And we also have 600 units at uh, the Hamptons and another 200 and so at uh, Marina. And, uh, you know, the this, this city, just, just because these things are entitled doesn't mean that they're, they're going to get built, but that, that is a lot of units. And I, I am very uncomfortable after having seen what went on with the, with the Valco project and, and how things um, how things were manipulated and changed that, you know, when, when our documentation says, you know, when our staff is telling us that it is a concession and they need to provide some financial documentation for that, that I don't understand why we are not going to hold the uh, developer accountable for that to provide that information. I mean, even for Valco, they could, they could do that. And, um, it, it, and it isn't a denial based on whether or, whether or not I personally like the project. Um, I, you know, I, I have concerns about how they used, used the laws to one, move all the senior units over t into one location and then increased the height, you know, some 30, 35 feet over what our uh, requirement is in the general plan, kept the other side low um, and I, and I, you know, personally think that along Stevens Creek Boulevard, that they could have 
continued the you know five stories uh, along going on to the on ramp and you know increased the density there. Uh, I also have issues with uh, that they were allowed 83 density bonus units and that those aren't being taken. I, I disagree with the argument about parking, um, the underground parking, or the. Uh, for buildings one and two, those are the, the most expensive buildings, and yet they're able to provide underground parking. So I don't, I don't really think that the parking argument is uh, is adequate there. Uh, so, Chair Moore, may I say, sure. make a comment? Absolutely. So there are five commissioners for a reason. Um, you bring up valid points. However, the two um, commissioner Fung's point, we could motion and pass this three to two or four to one. Um, however, I think we do want to, I guess, discuss, I mean, based on public comment and um, some concerns, I, I think there are some loose ends, if you will, um, that I think need to be understood. Um, you know, what, the one I brought up and the one the public brought up was the, the documentation of um, the row housing being for sale units. But further, there was also concern about timing of the project in terms of sequence of building and then the fact that the builder himself had reservations um, and then people comparing that to Main Street where, okay, I can't get it done anymore. I can't get funding to build this affordable housing. So therefore, I'm, um, you, do you want it not built and, and, and have, to have this half project or will you let me now change this and make it market rate housing, right? And none of us want that either, right? So. I think there, we do want to, or I, I feel like we should discuss some of these loose ends, but I think right now, based on the staff report, and uh, this, we, we're not approving this, but we're making a recommendation to City Council. So City Council could go into all of these details, and they can, they have the final decision. So we are making a recommendation, um, and I think we have enough information to make that recommendation one way or the other. So, um, but I, I do think we need a little bit of um, language that, that somewhat a rec or part of our recommendation is that they, there would be some levels of controls in terms of how the, the future of this project potentially could end up and that there's some level of accountability from what's approved to what's finally built. So just a process question as well um, to just the staff as well and as well for people that are watching this. Um, so we are only making a recommendation to city council. If we recommend to disapprove, city council will still have to make their decision, um, but it's off our recommendation. If we make a recommendation to approve, um, they will also have to uh, address the concessions. And so I would like to take some time with um, Commissioner Takahashi to think about what those specific implications are, because whether we approve or not approve, the loose ends are still the important piece. And, and I think uh, I want to give more emphasis to what Commissioner Takahashi is talking about here. So whether we approve or disapprove it, it's, it's ultimately getting city council's attention that these are the things we are concerned about. The approval or the disapproval isn't going to do that. It's it's this uh, emphasis on what, what you're talking about, Alan. So let, let's go through each one of those, if you've got those. Uh, and we still don't have a motion on the table. So right, I don't know what we're discussing. I, I would <laughs> so. like to to see if if Barbara could uh, you know weigh in on because it sounds as though Vice Chair Wong, you're saying that it uh, it essentially doesn't matter if we approve or disapprove this uh, when it goes to City Council. And I'm wondering if if we were to approve it, um, have we now set into motion something where? Uh, it Commissioner Moore, I, I agree with you. I'm afraid we would set a bad precedent if we approve something. And I would love to know from Barbara about what that precedent would be for other projects. Uh, but to address the immediate need of the project, I was trying to direct us towards, and, and Commissioner Takahashi as well, towards the points that we all have loose ends on. So, but I'd love to hear the, 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 the precedent aspect as well. So sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, right. I mean, the precedent, if you were to recommend, say, approval of a concession when they haven't even applied for it. Is that, is that what you're talking That's about? That's actually exactly what I'm trying to say, but you've articulated it much better. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, if, frankly, if we didn't have this, if, if potentially there weren't a limit on meetings, and frankly, it's unclear if this project is covered by any limit, we'd suggest you continue the project. I mean, that would normally be what the Planning Commission would do, I think, it, you know, given where you are and the what I've heard of the dispersal requirement. 
because um, it would be unusual for a city to grant a concession when the applicant hasn't requested it. Right, but is, is that really what we're asking um, in terms of, we haven't made a motion, um, and I well, would I, assume. I, I, thought was the, I thought that was the question. That's all. Okay, I, all right. I, I, I guess I, I was, well, I think there's still an interpretation of is this disbursement into the building one really a requirement? You know, that, that kind of, which is what the applicant brought up in the first place in terms of the fact that it is an assisted living facility um, and, and the senior BMR. So, so you know, there's, there's all kinds of questions in how we structure a, a motion, it seems to me. Right. If you, were, if you were convinced by the applicant's argument that, there's, uh, that they're physically precluded from going into building one, you could approve it on that ground. Right. I was going to say that the first principles in the first principles to me does not preclude that. And that, that's why I was asking if we were setting a precedent. Um, and that's why my question was set up that way is are we setting up a precedent by approving a concession without an application? I think that's you've articulated very well there. And that, that's what I'm asking. So, yeah. uh, but that was concern number one, which is first principles. Concern number two to me was really the fact that for this project specifically, if we have specific concerns that we need to make a recommendation to council, we're never as explicit. We just either approve or disapprove. And once in a while we make some suggestions. I think it's important um, to, to make those suggestions. I mean, I think the way commission inter commissions make suggestions is by attaching conditions of approval. So if you, uh, yes. or modifying conditions of approval that the staff has recommended. And then, tip, and then, actually, state law requires that when it's um, that when it's noticed for the city council, that the, any changes that were recommended by the planning commission go into that public notice, and typically those are featured, if you like, in a staff report by staff. But yes. the way that can be done is by uh, either changing a condition of approval that was recommended by staff, or adding a condition of approval that. Uh, you know, possibly you feel is missing. Exactly. I, I wanted to make sure we were explicit there. So. Yeah. So you be that that how you be explicit. <laughs> yeah. So so maybe there's a maybe I'll take a simple example of that. The uh, commissioner Takahashi and uh, the vice chair have mentioned the issue around will the townhouse units in what way do we guarantee the townhouse units would be for sale units so. So for instance, an example of what you're saying would be a condition of approval might be added that those be for sale units. Is that yes. the kind of suggestion you're making? That's the way we would best recommend that. Yes. Okay. Um, Barbara, so how would you write a condition of approval that they apply for a um, concession? Hmm. <laughs> it's kind of a, this is a very, that's a very sticky one. Mm. Uh, Perhaps, perhaps what you would do is to apply the uh, the staff recommendation that they that they uh, move nine units into the assisted living, and that and then add to that. However, you know they can apply for a concession if they feel, if, you know. However, they could apply for a concession. I don't know exactly the words, <laughs> but but add to that condition something about you know the applicant has presented a financial reason. Um, this would be appropriate for a concession if the applicant, you know, wishes to pursue this issue. The applicant would uh, should apply for a concession, something like that. Uh, okay, so I, I have to say I'm not completely on board with 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 not having affordable assisted living and and you know removing some units from building two and and having them in in building one and and I've already said you know that I, my preference would be that in the townhouses and row houses that that some were or BMR units as well um, you know understanding that it's uh, it's uh, subjective I mean one way when once somebody makes a motion one way to uh, get disagreement if you like codified is that perhaps then there is a motion to amend that's voted on and <laughs> if you know if it's supported great if it's not supported then it's it's clear that there was a disagreement and what the specific disagreement was among the commissioners does that make sense <laughs> yes <laughs> it would just capture it for the record 
is, is, is your point. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So is it possible that we could structure this where we kind of step through what those elements are that we feel are um, ones that we want to specifically reference? Um, and then once we have that, then as a commission decide which ones from a majority perspective we think are critical that are referenced in our um, recommendation. Is that, is, that, is that one way we could do it or... I'm just looking for a way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. An end game here. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, one, uh, one way to proceed, most of the important uh, conditions are in the development permit. Uh, the ones about the, uh, the one, the ones about the, uh, all the waiver and, cons you know, all the waiver uh, findings are in that one. So you may want to make a motion. Somebody could make a motion just to approve it as, uh, well, you need to start with the, uh, with the CEQA, <laughs> sorry. First of all, somebody needs to make a motion about the CEQA, uh, the CEQA resolution. But then when you get into the substance of the project itself, someone can make a motion. I mean, one way to do it is somebody makes a motion to approve it. They could suggest that it be approved with uh, and describe the amendments they want, or they could just make a motion to approve it. And then uh, somebody else could say, I want to amend condition number so-and-so or finding number so-and-so, uh, see if you get a second, and then you know, kind of work through it that way. I mean, those are kind of the two, two ways. Okay. Or alternatively, we could recommend for a denial, say that we, that we do see this as a concession and it's not just a concession for buildings one and two, it's for a concession for, for the townhouses and row houses and, and because this has political implications and that the political issues are the realm of the city council, let them you know, wrangle that and, and make that ultimate decision for the community there. You could do that. I think I think city councils often appreciate, you know, kind of knowing the thinking of the planning commission, <laughs> but but it's however you would like to do it. Okay. I bet that that would require a motion and a majority vote um, to, to have that oh, finding as well. Everything right. requires a majority vote. All right. Five here. Right. So <laughs> is is there a, is there a scenario <laughs> where the planning commission does not? achieve an outcome or, or a consensus recommendation. Um, mm -hmm. what, 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 what happens then? If, if, if we're here at, I don't know, four in the morning and we're still talking Not and there. it's clear we can't find a solution, is it, would it, could it still go to city council with kind of here, here's the litany of things that were discussed and have at it? Is that a, is that a possible outcome? Um, you're, <laughs> Your ordinances say that you make a recommendation to the city council. So okay. I, I actually think you have a responsibility to make a recommendation okay. for All approval, right. denial, or whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but I mean, sometimes commissions are split two two. That creates that creates a bit of a problem. And then cities usually have some kind of a you know does that constitute a denial? Usually that constitutes a denial, but it's still the best you could do. But here you have five people, so. You know, I, I still look at that, uh, the uh, documentation for the concession is, is something simple and I don't, I, I'm unable to grasp why it's not, not a simple request. You know, what, what's the issue with, with that? So, you know, you recommend it for denial based on not having not having some financial documentation. They provide some, it sounds like it's a very simple item. You know, I don't understand why this is difficult. And then, and then city council goes, oh, well, they said they didn't have all the documentation they needed in order to feel comfortable with approval. They liked the project. And then, and then they say, oh, well, the, the, now we have the, that documentation. It's now been provided. Um, staff's looked at it. They, they agree with it, et cetera. And then, and then city council approves it. Uh, can that scenario, can, is that a foreseeable outcome? Sure, you can recommend denial. Chair um, and Planning Commission, either whichever path you choose to take, you, you need a motion on the table, 
right? Whether it's a motion to deny, motion to approve with a friendly amendment or, or not, you have to have a motion on the table to kind of initiate that process and kind of weed out where, where all five of you feel or stand on, on these very variety of issues. I mean, we can do a straw poll as well. Yes, you can. <laughs> We're denying the inevitable here. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to say, look, I think everybody on, this, on, this, on the commission wants, likes the concept of the project. I think it's a varying degrees of what the exceptions are and whether we actually went through the rule or not. And so I, I just, you know, I think I, I, I would convey that to the developer. It, it's a question right now of like what precedents we're setting and what might actually occur is one aspect. The other piece is how do we feel about retail? The other aspect is what's going on in this version. I think those were the three big issues. Is there a fourth? that we can get to. And then if someone, anyone make a motion, go either way. If it gets denied, it gets denied. And then we put it there. If it gets approved, we also put in the exceptions. So, yeah. Right, Ray, can you cover those three things again? Just, yeah. I, I, I want to make sure I got them. I think uh, the first one the was- version. In, or, yeah, or, where, where, where do you place the BMR units, right? In the application process. That was right. really the first issue we have. The second okay. one was an issue about, at least for me, was whether those retail units were going to be retail units. And then I think you brought up the okay. third issue. You had a third issue, which was you, you're talking about for sale units. For sale units, for sale. Oh, right. stay rental right. versus not, for not sale right. units. Okay. Those are the three right. units we have. Okay. Right. The three and, issues. And just, just to, right to clarify your concern on retail is that it is truly retail with 100 percent public access. Yes. Right? Like, is it like? Oh, well, sorry, we're shut down at 5 p.m. because we're no longer serving meals and we don't care about anyone after nine. Right. It's one of those kind of things. Or like you're the app. You're like Apple, which decides that. We only take Apple Pay and there's no cash. Sorry right. about that. <laughs> it's just, I, mean, I have Apple Pay, but, <laughs> yeah. but still, yeah. Also, you have a little over 8,000 square feet of, of the cafeteria space, um, which is catering towards the residents of Building One. And is that something, for instance, will Danza college students want to be going there to, going there to eat? Will it be a, an atmosphere which resonates with them and they feel comfortable going to? Um, you know, maybe it's actually a, you know, a great idea to have this, this mingling of the different age groups. Maybe that's, that's something people are... <laughs> you know, are excited about, maybe that works out great. Um, uh, however, in what you're saying, and you know, and, I'm, and I really would like people to, you know, hone in on this, this page 27, um, you know, this because the reason is financial, it does not demonstrate physical preclusion. Moreover, although the applicant is aware of the issue, the applicant has not requested a modification of this dispersion requirement as a concession slash incentive as defined in the density bonus ordinance. I, you know, I still feel stuck by this. Um, so we just we motion then, and then we, we can vote on it. We okay. can so I, I move. I, I I move that we recommend denial of the project, and this is a long motion. Um, the project as proposed is inconsistent with the BMR manual's requirement that BMR units be dispersed throughout the residential project. While the planning commission recommended waiving this requirement as applied to the non-age restricted portion of the project when the applicant was proposing to disperse the BMR units between the two senior buildings. The waiver is not justified for the current proposal, which proposes to consolidate all senior BMR units in building two. The applicant's reason for not dispersing BMR units in building one is, such, is that such units would not qualify for funding from low income housing tax credit. Because this reason is financial, it does not demonstrate physical preclusion. Um, I would like to further add that we have the physical preclusion issue existing in the townhouses and row houses for the project as well, which would require some BMR units. Moreover, although the applicant is aware of this issue, the previous issue, and now the one I'm mentioning about the townhouses and row houses, the applicant has not requested a modification of this dispersion requirement as a concession or incentive as defined in the density bonus or ordinance. Because the project is inconsistent with this development standard and does not qualify for a waiver, the project should be uh, denied. And it has nothing to do with whether or not I like the project. It has to do with following the rules and presenting them to city council for them to make a decision on. And like I said, if the applicant can you know, just bundle up some financial documents and hand it to city council to deliberate on, that's great. So that's the motion. Uh, Chair, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, just for completeness' sake, if, if that's your motion, I recommend you also include the uh, CEQA exemption language for a denial, which is uh, contained in the recommended 
um, or rather the, the denial draft resolution, but the provisions you would include there are exempt from CEQA under Public Resources Code 21080B5 and CEQA guidelines 15270. And, and it also covers a denial of uh, the a denial of all the permits. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you, it's there. Uh, okay, one yeah. intro. Planning Commission recommends to city senior count to city council that one we find that this action is not subject to environmental review under section two one zero eight zero subdivision B, section five and one five two seven zero of the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA guidelines because CEQA does not apply to projects which an agency rejects or disapproves. Two, deny the following permits as set forth in the attached draft for resolution, development permit DP 2018-05, architectural and site approval ASA 2018-05, vesting tentative map TM 2018-03, tree removal permit TR-2018-22, use permit U-2019-03, and heart of the city exception EXC-2019-03. Do I have a second? A second. Madam Clerk, will you call the vote? I think we have to discuss, right? Is that correct? Unnecessary. Oh. Okay. Unnecessary? Yeah. yeah. Okay, because we were going to put amendments yeah, and exceptions if we do that, correct? Either uh, way. You could, sorry. I think that was only if we approve it. I mean, if we're denying yeah. it, I don't know what the point of putting any. Um, um, I still think the logic of the denial needs to be there. That's all. Okay. Well, I mean, I, uh, uh, COVID, uh, Vice Chair. Well, I think while, uh, while we're denying it, the right messaging has to go out of what's the reason and, what's, and if we possibly suggest a way forward, we could also do that. Okay. I mean, I just want to, if we deny it, wouldn't we also want to explain here's what that the reason for the denial or is it just pretty obvious? Um, well, well the, the first part from page 27 was explaining that essentially we're taking everything that staff said in their recommended denial of the project um, paragraph and incorporating that into the motion. Okay. And if we approve it, then that's why we do the exception. That's kind of what you were saying earlier. Is that kind of the process? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure I understand that. We're, okay. All right. All right. I have no other discussion. Then. No further discussion. Um, Madam Clerk, will you call the vote? Okay. Um, Vice Chair Wang. Um, so approval means that we, if I say I, we are denying. I just want to make sure we're clear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just important. I just want to make sure I'm doing it the right way. So, yeah. Sorry, since I went, I'm up first. All right, I, I'll say aye. Okay, Commissioner Takahashi? No. Commissioner Fung? No. Commissioner Saxena? Aye. Chair Moore? Aye. The motion carries a 3 2 with Takahashi and Fung voting no. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, and thank you everyone for participating in this portion of the meeting. And I know that this was a difficult decision. Uh, moving on, we have no old business or new business. Do we have any staff and commission reports? Uh, Chair Moore, I did want to bring at this time, uh, yes. Commissioner Saxena reminded me earlier in the meeting that while he was not present for the vote on the minutes, he did uh, eventually get the technical uh, issues worked out and did join the meeting. So I do have the minutes um, showing him as absent and I have amended those minutes to show when he came in. We can either um, go ahead with your approval of the minutes and I'll submit them as amended or uh, I can bring them back to you at the next meeting for a reapproval. Um, why don't you bring them back to the next meeting for reapproval? Fine, I'll do that. Thank you. And finish up tonight. Uh, it's been a long evening. Um, okay, uh, do we have any further uh, staffing commission reports? Uh, I, I, no further staff reports. 
All right. Thank you, Ben. Vice Chair? I don't have a report, but I just have a process question. And it's been trying to ask this since we've gone to the Zoom meetings. Uh, do we just give up on the Pledge of Allegiance? Does that thing just go away yeah. in these meetings? I'm just kind of curious. That's all. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I just to say, that. In the documentation that I've been given, there's I don't see the pledge. Um, I'm just wondering. I mean, you know. Well, it, it does make it a little awkward. You could you could have a screen um, provided by staff which shows um, the a American flag, flag, flag. In it. Yeah. Right. I, you know, I, I do technically see one off off to your left. Um, oh, that one. Other. <laughs> yeah, I should go hug that, right? Uh, it could be fun. Um, it, if you if you if we want to bring it back, let's do that. I are you asking for it? Just yep. didn't know. I just thought it was a process weird thing because I've seen them in some other meetings from other cities. I just didn't know, like we just completely dropped it in our city. And I didn't know if that was like intentional or is that with the order from the governor or if that was just convention. That's all. Um, you know, that's a good question. We could we can ask the mayor, uh, you know, and let let uh, city council provide some direction on that. Mm -hmm. so, okay. you know. Ray, if we do that, then you're going to have to stand up and then we'll know you're wearing shorts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you I check out my blog, guilty. there's a whole virtual team guide, and there's a there's a point about making sure you're clothes, <laughs> like when you do virtual meetings. Okay. So, um, so I, I did attend the the housing commission meeting um, last week, and they went over their their work plan, and in it, you know, they were talking about providing all kinds of housing um, f for the community, including homeless housing. Um, which, you know, as we've seen, you know, the Wolf Road encampment continue to grow. And then just a few days ago, there were fires on uh, both sides of the 280 that had shut down traffic. Um, so it, that area really needs some, some attention. And, uh, you know, they're, they're looking into trying to figure out what kind of funding that uh, they have available for that issue. Um, you know, are there any other comments from the commissioners? Okay. All right. If no further comments from the staff and commission reports. This meeting is adjourned. Good night. Good night.